everybody and welcome to your weekday weekend i'm adam and um it is actually the weekend it's saturday um how lucky hello revan what's up man how lucky that my webcam is actually properly set up it would seem look at that wow it's it kept my settings Jeez. hello revan what's up man good to see you I am going to um, quickly mention. Uh, tired, but couldn't sleep anymore, bro. That, yeah, that's that sounds about right. <laughs> um, good to see you, Revan. Um, so uh, today we will be learning Godot, and at some point I will call it Godot, and I will get pissed at myself for calling it that. So. You now know in advance that I will screw it up and catch myself. So, it's Gudo. Um, we're not going to be in Engine technically today. We're going to be, ugh, excuse me, learning Gudo uh, GD script, I believe it's called. Um, there is a web app that I was shown by Sazanek, uh that we will be using. Um, um, it's been pretty good. I was laying in bed trying to sleep, but I was getting annoyed laying there. Yeah, I, yeah, I've done that so many times where I've tossed and turned for three hours. I'm like, no, I'm going to get up and spend my time wisely. So, um, 
Hey, that's okay, Sauce. That's okay. Appreciate you being here at all, man. Appreciate you. Um, anyway, yeah, it should be a pretty chill stream today. So I did get, I'm on uh, this, um, it's like a GitHub app to learn GD script. It's been very useful and it's not been too bad. I did get ahead of the lesson we're in. So we're on lesson 13 conditions. Now, um, invited me for gaming. Hey, oh, exactly. Yeah, got to got to do that for sure. That's good, man. Well, uh, tell everybody I said hi. I know they don't know me, but tell them I said hi, and then I'm sorry they're in Poland. No, I'm kidding. Don't tell them that. Um, unless they're not in Poland, then maybe they don't care. Um, but, um, yeah, well, I'm on lesson 13 conditions. I did get, like, four or five lessons further than this. Sydney, good morning. Hello. Good to see ya. Um, I did get further than this, uh, but... I was having some trouble understanding and I was getting frustrated and I hadn't had sleep at that time. So I've backed up a few lessons so that I can relearn and also to catch up. You know, whenever you haven't been on something in a while, you should probably back up a little bit and refresh yourself. So that's where we're at. So. I have some water. Not sponsored. By, uh, by Circle. But I do like that. That bottle. Um... Okay, so this, as I said, is a teaching tool for uh, Godot, uh, GD script. Okay, in previous lessons, we just uh, decreased and increased a character's health, but there was no limit to how much they could have. As a result, the player could increase their character's health indefinitely, which we do not want. Yes, yes, all the health. Yes, depending on the game, that's still not a lot. <laughs> yes. Yes, much health. Much health. Okay. What happens when we damage our character? Suppose our character has 100 health. What would the value of health be if we if we did... Oh, it should be zero. Oh, five times. I'm sorry. I said five. I'm dumb. If I read, I would have gotten the question right. Uh, we can use conditions to run active selectively. Yep. Conditions are like the biggest, most important part of any code, right? Conditions is there's some software and games that are literally entirely conditions. Lost legend. Anyway, um, video games and other computer co programs are full of conditions. Yep. Uh, if statements, if the player presses a, the button on the gamepad, the controller, the character jumps. It's a very weak jump, but I'll take it. When the computer checks condition, it, uh, it's called to evaluate. All conditions evaluate, true or false, yep. Either player is pressing the button or not. Character is touching the enemy or not, in our case. If the health goes over a maximum value, we want to re reset it to the maximum. To define a condition, we use the if keyword. Write a line starting with if, type the condition to evaluate, and end with a colon. I'm surprised it hasn't actually, like, I can gather that a pound symbol is, um, for comment. But I'm surprised that it hasn't actually, like, mentioned how to comment things out. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so Sid, how is your morning going so far? Revan told me how his is going, which is okay, depending on how you like the idea of not being able to sleep very well, but... All right. Now the greater than uh, comparison sign, this symbol is greater than. Uh, see now function def uh, definitions use a colon at the end, the first line, and nest content inside GD script. This syntax is a recurring pattern for all code blocks. Computer knows which instructions belong to the condition because they're indented. Good call. Nice. Cool. Absolutely nuts. My puppy got into something she wasn't supposed to and 100% thought I was going to have to take her to the emergency vet. Jeez. I hate that. I... I get that for sure. Um... It... 
It makes sense. I, I've been there and done that. It, um, it sucks, but puppies just get into things. Usually it's fine, unless they got into, like, razor blades or something, but... Uh, which of these statements is true? Three is greater than one. Two is less than three. One is not equal to three. Table phase of taking things off tables and counters. My cats do that. My cats get on the fucking stove and it pisses me off so much. But I don't know how to solve it now. I can't always just sit in the kitchen and continue to spray my cats when they get on the stove. Because they will never learn. I've gone in there and screamed at them so many times, they don't care. So, at this point, negative reinforcement is not is not helping. This is something that is interesting. This pass, um, the way I've understand it is it's basically a placeholder. Saying like, yeah, I'm going to put something else there now. This code is is not complete but run it anyway for me please it's just like yeah so basically this can't be empty for you to test your code you have to have something there but if you don't know what you want to put there yet then you use pass and it will just run over it and not care essentially which is really cool um i like that because there's so many times where you have to put something there just to make it run take stuff off the tables in the kitchen too literally try to get food out of a pan yeah, no, our cats will, I have to rinse the pan out instantly after we're done eating, or they will literally lick the grease out of the pan, like from like, um, I make beef, like hamburger meat, they will literally lick the, the leftover grease off the bottom of the pan, or bacon grease, and it's, it really pisses me off. Uh, okay, the if keyword comes with a complementary else keyword. You can write else block after an if block, like so. Which is always nice. Um, it also says you can, not you must, you can. Which is interesting as well. Else block will run whenever the condition above is not met. Uh, in the following practices, you will use conditions and improve the way your character's health changes so it has limits. Cool. Okay. I've already done this, but we're gonna... Can I reset this? I don't see a reset because I've already solved it. But this is what I wrote. Um... Yeah, okay. So, if statements aren't that difficult, I can certainly... Um, oh, it did start it over. Never mind. I thought... I thought it... Okay, it did start it over. I thought, because this was all... Okay. No, okay. Uh, health is greater than five... Boink. Uh, one is less than health... Good. Health is equal to health. There we go. Health is not equal to seven. There we go. Run. I thought I didn't even read it. Almost like I should read it. Okay. We have a heal function that adds the amount to the character's health. Add to the function so the character's health is never greater than 80. If health greater than 80, health equals 80, 80. Uh, hang on. Health plus equal amount. If health greater than 80, health equals 80. What? Health plus... What the hell did I do wrong here? I actually don't know.
Um, should it not be in the same function? Oh, well, no. And this has to be indented into the function. I don't understand. What did I do wrong? Am I? Oh, that's comparative and I'm dumb. I use two equals for whatever reason. I'm not comparing. I'm um, setting the variable. That's that was my fault. Okay. Um. Okay. Okay. Health minus amount if health is less than zero, health equals zero. There we go. Cool. Nice and complete. All right. Our robot's health is always between 0 and 100. But as a robot fights, we want to increase its strength and toughness. When a character levels up, might deal more damage to enemies, gain new abilities, or in our case, gain more health. To find a level variable to keep track of our level of the robot, starts at level 1. When the robot has defeated enough enemies, we call the level up function to increment the robot's level. Uh, here, level one, function level up, level plus equals zero. Uh, as we briefly saw in the last lesson, our robot could have a range of variables that could increase when it levels up. Cool. The variable max health is the maximum amount of robot's health can be. We change our heal function to use this variable. That makes sense. We could add five to the max health every time the robot levels up, but that, that would be very linear. Most people don't like that. Yeah. I know we want linear. We multiply by like 1.1. We want it to be like that. Exactly. That's the exponential. With each level more max health is added in the previous level up. Exponential growth. Yeah, so 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, what is the value of damage? Calculate damage. Damage equals power times level, 15. Uh, we can use multiply in the same ways as subtract and add. Value of damage now. Variable damage, it should be 30. Okay, let's uh, level up a robot and add exponential growth to max health. 1.1 practices increase the robot's max health and add a special ability to make our robot uh, extra tough. Okay, cool. Level up. Increase the level by one. Level one. Oh, one. Max health by 10%. Max health. I believe that is what they want. Cool. All right. Um, what is your puppy's name, Sydney? I forgot. Um, I think you guys mentioned it to me the other day when we were playing Jackbox, but I don't remember. When our robots level is three or more, we want it to take a lot less damage. Add to the take damage function, so the following happens. If, if the robot... Hang on. Uh, 
uh, if a level greater than two uh, damage Nami uh, Nami or Nam is it pronounced Nami or Nami? It seems like it seems Japanese, but either way, that's very cute. Uh, damage uh, should reduce to five, so equal zero point five. Okay. Uh, that should work. Um, hang on. Amount, not damage. Oh, I did. I did multiply the amount by 0 0.5. Does it know what's a zero? No, it does. Um, oh, it's taking the health before the, hang on, now it'll work. Not me. Got it. Got it. Suppose we want to increase the size of our robot when it levels up. As you may recall, we can do this by using the following code. I don't recall. This X and Y extras is... Scale X, scale Y. Got it. Apparently, we're zooming in right on his crotch. Quite the big robot. Quite the big robot. We're just, he's just going to keep getting bigger. Still getting bigger. I don't know how many times I've clicked this now. That's a very big robot. It's getting very blurry. They really didn't use a very high quality, um, Quality sprite for this, huh? She acts just like the character we uh, we named her after. Nice. That's good. That's very good. I think. I don't know the character. Hopefully the character is good. Also, this robot's getting fucking huge now. Like, cool. As we talked about in lesson seven, the scale variable has two sub variables to it: x and y. Blessing and a curse, of course. Of course. All the best things in life are. All the sass. Bro, that was my dog Suki back in the day. Oh my god. I say back in the day. It's not been that long. She. Lots of sass. Um, so much sass. Like. That dog is the most sassy dog I've ever seen in my life. Um, let's see. Scale is a vector 2, which stands for a two-dimensional vector. A vector 2 represents 2D coordinates. What are vectors? A vector in physics is a quantity with a magnitude and a direction. For example, a force applied to the same object, the velocity, speed, and direction of a character, so on. You often represent this quality with an arrow. Godot. 2D vectors are common value type named vector 2. Unlike plain numbers, they store two decimal numbers, one for x and one for y. So far, you've come across two variables in the course, which are vectors. What are they? Uh, scale and position. Vectors are great for games. They're essential. Allow you to represent a character's movement, speed, and direction. Calculate the distance to a target more with a little code. Take this AI turtle. You've seen games where enemies move like this. This is done with seven lines of pure vector calculation code. It was a bit too difficult for now, and we'll spare you the details, but this turtle gives you a glimpse of what excuse me, 2D vectors can do for you and your game projects. Nice. This turtle's really hungry for my mouse, huh? Interesting that he follows uh, no matter where it is on screen. Interesting. 
uh, we scale the robot again, this time adding it uh, adding to it directly using a vector 2. The following code is the same effect as the previous example. I almost like the other version better, I don't know. The other version of the code, I almost like that better. I don't know, I'm, maybe I'm picky. But it seems easier to understand. Um, I feel like I'd always rather modify the variable. I know I am modifying the variables directly, but I feel like I'd rather for sure type X is going up by this and Y is going up by this. I don't know. I know it takes more, more lines of code. Maybe I'll change my mind. Maybe it'll make more sense to me. I don't know. Cool. All right. Parentheses, two arguments inside parentheses, just like other function calls. Uh, call this con a constructor function call. It was a special kind of uh, function that creates a particular type of value. The code vector2.2.2 constructs a new vector2 value with its x set to 0.2 and its y set to 0.2. Using vector to change position. Interesting that that loops. Cool, cool. How would you move it to those 50 pixels left? That one. Okay. Uh, all right. Add a line of code to level up function to increase the scale of the robot by. Okay. Um. I think I remember hating this one because it didn't tell me what to use for scale. I think I just used scale and it worked like this, but, um, I guess it did highlight it blue. I must have been really tired. Krusty, hello, welcome. I'm guessing you are the Krusty that, um, joined the Discord. Welcome to the party. I appreciate you being here. What's up? Hello, hello. Welcome to the Krusty Crab. Or the U crab? All good? Nice, nice, nice. All right. How are you? Uh, robot's level has increased a lot. So it has, uh, so has its size. Uh, increase that robot. Um. Didn't know in the game dev as well. Uh, I used to do basically all game dev on stream years ago on a different channel. Um, but it's been a long time and I've never used this engine. So. Um, that's why I'm kind of doing a learning thing. But yes. Um. And then scale equals vector two, uh, one, one. Uh oh. Oh, duh. There we go. All the best, bud. Always. Uh, I've seen you can use functions to reuse code. This is where I started to struggle. This is where I started to struggle. That's sorry. Okay. All 
Oh, thank you so much for the follow. I didn't realize my audio is set to my monitor and not my headphones, but thank you so much for the follow. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Really appreciate it. It's very kind of you. Um, really appreciate it. All right. So, uh, all right. Diagonal by adding a vector to directly. Cool. <clears throat> the above code works for predefined board size with vector 2, 3, 3. But the move to end function wouldn't work size the board different. Implement a general solution for all board sizes. We can repeat the robot's movement until it goes to the end. While loops to repeat code. Yeah. Cool. Krusty, how did you find my channel? Just gotta ask. You know, just just a little market research. How did you find my channel in my Discord? Where uh, where have you come from? Where did you go? A Libra video. Nice. Okay. Sweet. Sweet. Cool. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for watching that video as well. A while to make computer repeatable code and make sure blah, 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 blah. Here's how to use a while loop. Gotta make sure you increase what it's looking for every time, or it'll be infinite. Use a variable number to keep track of how many loops while the while loop completes. So each time you go through the loop, we add one to the number. The while loop keeps running, this addition is true. In this case, it keeps running uh, while number is less than four. You can see the file is executed four times in the console. Yes. Let's apply this to our move to end function. This time, compare the number of loops to the board's width. We can go through the loop until we reach the width of the board. Right, so this position is one less the board width because we're counting tiles from zero. Zero, one, two. Okay. Um. We're going to three by three cells. We have cell coordinates going from zero to two on both the X and Y axes. All right. So if I do function move to end while well self is X less than board size dot X. So if I do well, cell that X is less than board size. But okay, not too bad. So I can increase this and it's going to show me. Okay. Yeah, I, um, I'm i going to get into game dev. I've done it before. But um, I, um, I'm because I'm learning this new engine. I'm kind of, this is like a, um, like almost like an online training course. Kind of get me up to speed on this, on this new game engine. Um, so. I'm, I'm learning. Uh, take a look at this code example. This will be an infinite loop because this this will never be, I'm sorry, this will never be false. Yeah. So that becomes a problem. Yeah. First, you will not need while loops often. Even the code we show here has more efficient alternatives. Safer kind of loop, bore loops. Look at the next lesson. Might try Godot in near future too. It's, I mean, as long as you look at it, you can't look at it as like, a lot of people gave Godot trouble because when Unity was uh, single-handedly screwing up their own engine, um, people jump to Godot and said, well, this is nothing like Unity. Well, duh, it's nothing like Unity. It's not supposed to be like Unity. It's Godot, not Unity. So, as long as you remember that it, it is its own engine, 
then you shouldn't have any issues. Now, I never used Unity, so I don't know what everyone was looking for in Godot that it wasn't compared to Unity. But, you know, as long as you remember it's its own engine, people make amazing things in Godot. Just ask uh, Sazanek. I think he's, he's lurking around. He's playing games with his friends. I won't bother him. But um, uh, he loves Godot, and he uses it uh, for game jams. So... And he makes some cool stuff with it, I gotta say. Um, I really agree with you. And that's most anything, right? As long as you, you can't directly compare to try to Unreal. I wanted to try Unreal so bad, I got like 20 minutes into it and didn't understand. It was just too in-depth for me. Um, Raylib. I've never even heard of that one. But there's yeah, there's so many options, and you gotta just understand that each one is kind of doing its own thing, and you can't just jump to Unreal from Unity or jump to Godot from Unreal or jump to X from Y and expect to not have to relearn at least some of how it works. Like you're gonna have to relearn. You're just gonna have to. So Or change girls. What? Huh? What? Huh? What? Don't know what you're talking about. Uh. Okay. There are other good uses for while loops. Uh, reading, processing a file, like text document, line by line, processing, constant stream of data, like someone recording audio with a microphone. Things have their personality and things like people. That's, yeah, that's true. That's true. It is, I, I guess in that, in that aspect, it is almost like changing girls. You can't treat like, you can't treat one, I cannot speak today. You can't treat one, treat, a, Try again. You can't treat one like the previous one. Like you gotta, you gotta relearn. Need some more water. It's too early for this. All right. Um. Let's practice some while loops, as they're useful to know. It's also an excellent opportunity to practice 2D vectors. Ugh. 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 Our robot has decided to stand at the top of the board, complete the move to bottom function, so the robot moves to the bottom of the board. Board size is determined by the vector to board size. The robot's current cell is vector two, uh, two, zero. Make sure to use while loops with the function that work with any board size. All right. Um, while cell dot x equal uh, is Less, less than uh, board size dot x minus one. Do I have to use a? I believe I do. Um. Uh, what move should I use? It's just cell dot x plus one. What is that? No. Oh, it's y. I'm freaking dumb. Wow, it's uh, <laughs> oops. Okay, now, now I'm... Oh, there we go. I guess I don't know when I need to do just a plus sign and when I do need to do plus equals. I, I guess I don't know. 
it seems like half the time it's one or the other. I thought pl uh, the plus equals were just for like making comparisons. But, uh, I guess, I don't know. I need more water. Okay. In the last lesson, we looked at while loops. Found they were useful for if we don't know how many times we should repeat the code. However, they could result in infinite loops if we're not careful. The loop below never ends because we never increment number. Safer and easier kind of loop, the for loop. I would hesitate to say it's easier because this, the for loop is what broke me last time I tried to run this. Um, so Krusty, you're kind of just now getting in. I mean, it wasn't live for long, but before you hopped in, I mentioned that, um, that I basically got around this far a little further, like a couple days ago, but I was tired and hangry and needed to go to bed. And, um, I kind of, I wanted to go back a few lessons to refresh myself. And here we are caught back up with what made me, made me quit uh, a few days ago. So here we are. The loop below never ends because we never increment number. There we go. Never goes up, so this will go forever. Excuse me. There's a safer enough and easier kind of loop to for loop. Look at it in this lesson. Really? I... That boggles me. I thought we were going to look at, like, geopolitical stance of... Geopolitical factors that go into, like, the French government or something. Like, introduction to for loop. I didn't know we were going to talk about for loops. I thought, like, I had no idea. Okay, unlike while loops, for loops don't run indefinitely. So it's much less likely that you'll get bugs in your game. We recommend favoring for loops over while loops because of this. Let's change the code above to use a for loop instead. The loop below will change the cell three times. Uh, cool, cool. Range function. Godot has a helper function range calling range n. Creates a list of numbers from n to n minus 1. So range 3 outputs number 0, 1, 2. Range 5 outputs number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, what numbers would range 6 create? That one. Cool. How four loops work. Remembering CS class. Yeah. Giving you flashbacks. Uh, how for loops work. Uh, and it, there's a very loud bird. In a for loop, the computer takes each value inside a list, stores it in a temporary variable. You have college. Nice, nice. Wish I could have afforded college. Oh, well. Um, yeah, it didn't work out for me. Uh, in a for loop, the computer takes each value inside a list, stores it in a temporary variable, and creates the... Co That's a really interesting for, uh, formatting there. That comma on the second line there. Executes the code in the loop once per value. For number and range, print number. So it should print 0, 1, 2. Cool. Sweet. In the above example... Each item in the list, Godot sets number to the item, then executes the code in the for loop. Plain arrays more thoroughly. Uh, thoroughly? That good. Uh, but notice that number is just a temporary variable. It can create it. Uh, you create it while defining the loop. Loop takes care of changing its value. Also, you can name this variable anything you, uh, anything you want. Code behaves the same. How oh, interesting they actually show the... Interesting. Yeah, that's not the hard part. I guess the hard part is more so the array. All right. Yeah, so that's the same thing, but it's just not a loop, so. Okay, we can put whatever we like in the loops code block. Uh, including other function calls like draw a rectangle. Yep, that makes sense. 
uh, using a for loop instead of a while loop. All right, so here's our old move to end function, which used a while loop. Um, cool. Uh, if we use a for loop instead, the code becomes a little simpler. I don't think that's really any simpler. In fact, this almost looks more complicated. This is much easier to understand. Like if if the cell is less than the board size minus one, then go ahead and, and move him. Otherwise, this just, this does not look as easy to understand to me, personally. But, so. Okay. Okay. Robots decided to stand at the top of the board. This time use a for loop and move to bottom function to make it move to the bottom of the board. Okay. Four. Number in range um, board size minus one. Um, uh, dot y minus one. Um, um, so I sell dot y. Yes, I did increase the coordinate. That's Oh, I'm just I'm just dumb. Okay. I need some more water. I will definitely take another sip of no water and then tell myself that I need more water like twice before I go get more water. Use a for loop to remove the duplicate code in the run function. In this practice, we revisit the turtle and drawing rectangles. Ugh. With our new knowledge of for loops, we can condense this code and uh, take up less space and make it easier to modify. The turtle should draw three squares in a horizontal line. These squares should be 100 pixels apart. Okay, so four number in range uh, three What? Oh Cool. Sweet. All right, I will return in like 60 seconds. I'm going to go fill up my water bottle. Um, like 60 seconds. Just got to go get me some water.
we go. All right, creating arrays. This is also the other part that was getting me confused last time. But we shall prevail. Thank you. Uh, how's how's the Sims, Sydney? Not spying on you. <laughs> no, it says in Discord that you're playing the Sims. Um, the range function. Amazing, dude. That's good. That's good. The range function we saw in the previous lesson outputs a list of numbers. For example, calling range 3 produces a list of numbers 0, 1, 2. Uh, cool. Yep. Print number. Cool. A list of values, numbers or otherwise, has a precise name and code. We call it an array. So we can call the, so we can say calling the range function produces an array of numbers. We would directly write and use that array inside a for loop. Uh, instead of the range function. All day making it playable. Other mods were out of date, so it was but Oh, yeah. That's the only problem with mods. And that's... That's why half the time... I... Play vanilla games. And I was like, why? There's so many mods. It's so cool. Well, it's because dealing with... I'd rather just play the stinking game... Like, if I really want to play a game, I don't want to spend an hour updating mods and updating the game or uh, reverting the game version or whatever. I just want to play the game. And that comes back to, like, different games for different mods. Like, Minecraft isn't so bad. After you get it all set up the first time, you can run modded Minecraft easy because Minecraft, at least when you select a version, doesn't continually update itself. It's not attached to Steam where it's going to go up, update behind, you know, behind the scenes. Like, it's still going to work. Um, but a lot of other games, like, you have to really work to keep the mods running. And I'd rather just play the stinking game. Um, so, yeah. Um, it's like the same thing with... Um, that's the only reason I haven't switched to Linux yet, probably, right? Is that, um, like, yeah, Windows 11 sucks. And you might notice I'm still running Windows 10 down there on this PC, at least. Um, my laptop runs on Windows 11 and I hate it. But the only reason that I haven't put Linux on it yet is because, well, there's two reasons. One is because half the, so the software that I use on a regular basis is not Windows compatible, like Photoshop. And a Libre, unfortunately, does not have a Linux version yet. I'm hoping they will soon. But uh, Adobe's been around for like 30 years now, and they very clearly don't care about Linux. So I was like, just use GIMP. I've tried. Once you use Photoshop, you'll never go back to GIMP. I'm sorry. I've tried. I've tried GIMP. As someone who used Photoshop for probably well over 2,000, 3,000 hours now. I mean, I did Photoshop in high school, man. I started on CS4. Like, when did... Hang on. When did Adobe Photoshop CS4 release? Uh... So, um, yeah, I mean, when you've known Photoshop for that long. Um, and then the other thing with Linux, like I was just, what uh, to relate to what we were just talking about. Stuff doesn't always work out of the box. Very infrequently does it work out of the box. There's some kind of extra code you need to run, something you need to type in the console, some kind of extra crap that you need to run. It doesn't automatically set itself up most of the time. And because I'm not a standard everyday Linux user, that stuff adds up for me. I don't know how to do this, this, and that in the, in the terminal. I'm going to need to find someone else who's running the same program, who's having the same problem, figure out what they did. Hopefully they knew what they were doing and they posted it online, copy and paste their code, and go enter that into the console. Like Otherwise, I'd be using Linux every day, but I don't... Usually I'm like, okay, I need to have this thing. I have to leave for work in 20 minutes. I need to have this thing started before I go to work. 
and I don't have time to screw around with it for half an hour. So that, unfortunately, is why. Sounds like all game crashes on Windows 10. I've never had a game crash on Windows 10. Well, obviously I've had a game crash on Windows 10. I've never had it be Windows 10's fault. Um, uh, it's... I just don't want to have to spend all my time debugging and and troubleshooting something that should just work. Um, okay, list of numbers, call it an array. Yep, that's the same thing. Okay. As you can see, the code still works the same. Notice that when we create a for loop, we also create a local variable to which loop assigns one variable, uh, one value per iteration. Both we name it number, but uh, because the array we loop over contains three numbers, you can name it anything you want. Uh, issues to this last update with a lot of games, because they released a half-assed patch. Yeah, I mean, that's just Microsoft now, isn't it? At least Windows 10 wasn't screwed from the start. Well, actually it was, but it actually got fixed. But like Windows 11, was okay at start and now they've just been adding update after update after update to just make it so much worse like i probably spent so when i first got my my new laptop it's a lenovo loq it's just kind of a mid-tier gaming laptop budget gaming laptop right and i was expecting to have to remove a ton of bloatware because I, I bought it from Lenovo and it's a laptop, so I'm expecting I'm gonna have to remove Reno. I'm gonna have to remove Lenovo this, Lenovo that, Lenovo this, Lenovo that. I have to uninstall probably Norton or McAfee or uninstall some extra bullshit and uninstall all this extra crap that I don't want. No, Lenovo had one thing installed that I had to uninstall. You know who had a whole bunch of extra bullshit that I had to uninstall? Microsoft. I probably spent three hours uninstalling bullshit from that laptop that was just installed by default with Windows 11. I can get Windows 10 set up how I want it in probably 25 minutes. Like, get rid of Cortana, go in the registry and disable Cortana because, of course, there's no freaking switch for it. Remove the search bar from the bottom of my taskbar. Um, remove all the ads from your stupid... Um, from your start button and all the tiles and extra bullshit they don't need. Um, get rid of fucking Microsoft Edge. Dear God. You know there was a lawsuit about Microsoft uh, pre-installing and forcing you to use Edge or um, I think it was Windows uh, Internet Explorer at the time. There's a lawsuit about that because they're basically forcing it down people's throats and forcing them to use it at least once. No, especially in the days of the internet. How else are you supposed to get a different browser? And that's the joke. Oh, um, what is my purpose to install a different browser? That's your purpose, Edge. But like, I literally now use a USB drive. I'll go use Brave Browser on this PC to get the Brave Browser installer, put that on a USB, and put it on a new computer. I'm not going to use Edge. And the whole everyone's like, well, why not? You're just using it once. That one time you use Edge, they gather all your data right there. Not that they're not already grabbing it with Windows, but it has all the opportunities to grab all your extra stuff. So, uh, I hate OneDrive since it split a file in half and it's stupid it's active from the start. That's another thing I had to uninstall. I'm trying to become more and more and more independent. I don't want to rely on Google. I don't want to rely on Microsoft. And uh, that's one of the reasons I wish Linux was so much better. Because, like, I've stopped using Google Drive. So Brandon and I went halvesies. Um, I was paying for one thing and he was paying for another. So he put me on his Google One plan or whatever. So I got like 100 gigabytes of drive storage on Google Drive, which was great. You know, not Google Drive is all right, except for trying to deal with RPG Maker. But you know that story. Um, but so when everything, blew, when everything happened, um, I was just kind of arbitrarily removed with no warning. And I don't blame Brandon for that. Um, but not going to point fingers, but one day, basically I got an email from Google saying, Hey, you're 75 gigabytes over your limit of 15 gigabytes. And then another email saying you've been removed from Brandon's family plan. Oh, good. So at that point I'm like, well, I'm not paying fucking however much a month for Google one. So I created my own NAS. Now I have 500 gigabytes of storage 
that I can use whenever, wherever. I just use an old crappy laptop that I had laying around my house as, as a storage drive. So, um, I'm just trying to become way more independent. And that way, if my data's out there, it's my own damn fault. No data breach of some huge company is going to cause me to lose my data. No crash of some huge company. No company going out of business. No uh, payment missed is going to cause me to lose my shit. It's me and me alone. And I'm I'm responsible for my own stuff now. And it feels so much better. Um, so. So, yeah. It's a change in lifestyle, but it's been feeling a lot better more recently. So, um, okay. As you can see, the code still works the same. Note that when we create a for loop, we also use a local variable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can use any word we'd like. Um, if we unwrap the for loop above, we'd get the following code with the exact same behavior. Easy enough. Okay. Um, easy enough. We write arrays this way in GD scripts. Square brackets. They can include other things like vectors, um, which is beyond me. Because arrays themselves are a value type, just like numbers of vector two, we can assign arrays to variables and access them later. Uh, come in handy next lesson, we'll use those variables in loops. Okay. First, let's see, let's see when you'd use an array. Computer program, we use arrays all the time. Precisely use them whenever you need to store a list of things. You can always uh, you can always need lists and games, uh, their party, items in the player's inventory, high uh, scores in an arcade game, objects in the game world. Using arrays to follow a path. Let's look at a widespread use of arrays in games. Finding and following a path. Um, cool. Okay. Cool, cool. Fill with coordinates. Yeah. Get vector two. Uh, one, zero. Okay. Uh, we want. Now we want uh, one, one, and then one, and then two, one, and then three, one, four, one, five, one. Four, one, five, one. Vector two, uh, five, two. In this tactical game, is it is it tactical? Are you, are you sure? Uh, the player and computer can select multiple units at once. You'll need to call the select units function and pass it an array of vector two coordinates to know which units to select. Vector two an array represents a cell with a unit.
Okay, so that's... There's... There's... Four of them. We have... One zero. We have... Um... Five one. We have zero four. And we have four two. Zero three, not zero four. I think I did that the first time I did this one too. Cool, we use the range function in combination with for loops. Yay! The range function produced an array that the for keyword could loop over. Uh, we can give for loops any array and they will loop over them just the same. Instead of using the range function, we could manually write the numbers and get the same result. Each element in the array, the for loop extracts its storage in the temporary variables named numbered and executes the loop's code once. So the loop can access the number variable, which changes in each iteration. Code works regardless of the array where you store it. You can store arrays and variables for easy access. Okay, cool. This code print. This is the part I had the most trouble with last time. That they didn't really explain all that much. Function move path. For cell in path, turtle move to cell. This is the one that I didn't like understand. So. In addition, the in keyword allows you to check if a variable exists in an array. The array's append function appends a new value at the end of the array. So, arrays will function exists only on a specific value type. You can write a dot at the value to follow the function on it. Revisit those two features again in following lessons. Okay, good, because I that doesn't make any sense to me. Set up and sell. Sell and sell if cells in, in units. But cell isn't an array. Those ones are. What the hell? I don't understand. Okay. Um, the beauty of loops is that they work regardless of the size of your arrays. Uh, the code just works whether you have one or 10,000 units to select. Um, is all accomplished with only a couple lines of code. It's the power of computer programming. In the following practices, you will use arrays combined with for loops to achieve similar results. Now, I'm pretty sure I will achieve uh, errors and failure, but. Uh, we'll try it anyway. Our AI pathfinding algorithm provided a path for the robot to move to the right edge of the grid. Your task is to use a for loop to make the robot move. Move the robot, use its uh, 
move to function like so robot dot move to um cool how like this one was I hated this one I had no clue how to do this it didn't I feel like I wasn't taught enough to make this work okay so four obviously four movement in robot path right um robot dot move move to um movement oh my god Okay, so it's why this and this have a relationship that I don't understand. So I'm not going to bother him because he's playing games, but I'm going to take a screenshot of this guy real quick. And I will ask Saz later. Maybe he can explain better why there's a relationship there. Okay. Uh, desktop. Okay. Continue. We want to draw many rectangles, something surprisingly common in games. However, using this code by hand can get tedious. Instead, you could store the size of your shapes in arrays and use a loop to draw them in all in batches. Here's what you need to do in this practice. Use a for loop to draw every rectangle in the rectangle size of the array with the draw rectangle function. Okay, why am I not doing the draw rectangle function then? Because the rectangle shouldn't overlap or cross each other. To avoid that, you'll need to call the jump function. Okay. Okay, so four. Um... Um, so okay, I think I get it actually. So basically this is, so I should really call this size because this is going to basically it's look at the four is taking this and placing it in this for each of these. So draw rectangle um, size. Um, And then jump um, size. Can I do size dot x? Is that will that will it let me? Will that will that work? At least two. Why? Why would this need two arguments? Too few arguments. Why? Draw a rectangle size, and here's your sizes. Right. Why would I need? Two. These are vectored. 
That's so weird that I need to... These are vector twos. So why is it? I guess it is. Jump command expected. Okay. Cool. I think I'm actually getting it. I just need to know that if I'm putting a vector two value into this, it doesn't stay a vector two value. I need to either put vector two here or mention specifically X and Y. Otherwise it doesn't know what the hell I'm talking about. Okay. Throughout this course, We've mostly stored numbers and variables, but what if we wanted to store a player's name? Hey, what's up, uh, bro? Rice, Rice, stay, Ray, stay, L, Rice, still. I am so sorry for butchering that. Welcome. Thank you so much for the follow. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Um, we are looking at learning GD script for Godot. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I'm not dumb, I swear. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm gonna fail miserably, so I hope you enjoy watching that. Um, anyway, throughout this course, we've mostly stored numbers and variables. What if we wanted to store the uh, player's name? This is where strings help us. Strings are instrumental in games and applications. We use them to display information such as the description or of a spell, name of a character. Um, string is a value type which holds text. To create a string, you write text wrapped in quotation marks. Uh, for example, this is a text string. Uh, quotation marks differentiate strings from other variable types and function names. You may remember we've used strings before in previous lessons. We sure have. Under the hood, strings are arrays of characters. In fact, we can use a for loop to loop through the characters of a string. Really? Oh my gosh. Huh. I don't think I got this far with, um, I think this is lesson 21 is, is the latest. Character, uh, okay, that's the debugger. Uh, which of these are strings? Those two. Uh, every piece of text you see in this app is a string that Godot is displaying for us. It's like how vector two variables make calculations. These are string variables come with many helper functions and tricks we can use. Okay, so this, I did get to this one. I remember now. We can use arrays to store strings too. This is useful for chaining animations. In this example, play animation plays a specific animation. Cool. Uh, function perform combo for action in combo. Uh, play animation. Cool. We have, the robot has a number stored in the robot name variable. Um, quick, somebody, what name should I give the robot? Anything. What name should I give the robot? Somebody, please. Anybody. Quickly, quickly, I need the creativity. Help me. Marcus, Marcus came first. Ooh, I, I like pickle though. How about Marcus the pickle? There we go. There we go. We got them both. Marcus the pickle. Did it. Maybe. Hang on. Man. Yeah, there we go. Good. 
All right, using an array of strings to play a combo. In this practice, we'll chain together animations using an array of strings. You might find such combinations in fighting games. The robot has a following animation names. Jab, uppercut. Two jabs followed by one uppercut. Okay. Combo is jab, 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 uppercut. And then... Each four, four backward animation in combo. Um, I think that's it. Hey, I'm actually borderline understanding it this time around. Believe it or not, I'm actually borderline understanding it this time around. The last time I did not get it. I was blown away. All right. But we're doing all right. This this might have been where I left off. I don't know. The deeper I go, the less I remember because I was starting to get more pissed. Okay. Until now, you learned that functions are sequences of instructions that give a name you can call any time. On top of that, functions can make calculations and return new values. Let's look at some examples of why it's useful. Built-in functions, function, functions. What the fuck is a functional? Built-in functions that return a value. Many functions built into GDScript make calculations and return a new value. For example, the round function makes a decimal round des, decimal. Wow. Maybe maybe I need to go back to bed. Makes a decimal number as an argument. And gives you back a few num uh, new number rounded to the nearest digit. So that and that's built in. Yeah. Okay. Calculate the house percentage decimal number going from zero point zero to hundred point zero. Find the house. Oh, I see. You would want to round. Okay. So round function like so. Oh. I see. Yeah, I remember. I remember this now. I I did get this far barely. When displaying the health on the interface, you don't want to show the decimal part. In that case, you may use the round function like so. Beautiful. Notice how we assign the results of the function call to a variable. So variable rounded health equals round health. Set text to rounded health. Okay. Interesting. Uh, I think, I don't know if I did the practice for this. I think I stopped in the middle here. Um, set text round. Okay, and we can do it all in one. Hello again, Saz. Welcome back. It's going okay. I was, I took a screenshot of something to ask you a question about it, but I think I learned it did myself. So... No, uh, the four loops were tripping me up a little bit, but I I got it. I just needed to think about it a little bit longer. I think I got it now. So we're we're doing uh, returning values of functions. Yeah, I think I got it now. I think I understood. Um, I think they're great. They're really useful. It, yeah, exactly. I think I was mentioning to you I was having trouble with the four loops, but I think I got it. Um, the trouble I was having was the relationship between the for loops own variable that it's that it's using as like it's like it's holding place and then what you're using after that using that same so it'd be like for number in sequence sequence is your array using number was what's confusing me and that, that I got it now that it takes the sequence and individually as it repeats 
sets the next value to number and i i got it got you i, I did it brain is almost functioning <laughs> I ruined it with alcohol about six or seven years ago. I'm using what I got left. Kids, don't do drugs. Or alcohol. Or you know what? Life kind of sucks too. Just don't. Just don't. Just stop with where you're at. Just, wow, that sounded really bad. Maybe don't. Never mind. Cut. Hi, Twitch uh, manual moderator. Everything's fine here. <laughs> uh, or the YouTube moderator um everything's fine all right uh cooler example lerp why does it sound like they're like okay we need a name for this thing that we're gonna do um um uh squirple uh diddle daddle uh uh lerp got it oh that was no 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 sauce no no way no no sauce no No, way, it's us. Don't do it. You have so much to live for. If I want to move to a different country, but you have so much to live for. <laughs> Hello again. <laughs> Linear inter. Oh. I don't get. <laughs> Maybe if I was. Uh, Interpol. Oh, Interpol. Okay. Yeah, okay. It, it would be easier to understand if I actually used the word interpolate more than, like, twice in my entire life. Oh, it... If I would have read... <laughs> Let your interpolate. If I would have just read... Okay. Calculates and returns a weighted average between two values. Takes three arguments, the two values to average, and a value between when and... When? When and zero to skew the result. In game programming, it's used to animate things moving towards the target with a single line of code. So, function underscore process. That'll be interesting. I'm, I'm probably going to have trouble with, with this. Delta. Uh, position equals lerp. Okay, three values. Position, get local mouse position, and... 2 times delta. And delta is the time between frames? The time it takes to draw the next frame? Right? So... Time elapsed since last frame. Yay, I did it. So I'm hoping to God that they show me what the hell this means then. And why the time between frames is the is the value here and why it goes here. And what the hell underscore process is. Okay, but this turtle guy... He cannot have my mouse. He cannot have it. I am way too amused with this. Every frame, the code calculates position somewhere between the turtle and the mouse cursor. The lerp function takes care of everything. It's not the most robust approach for smooth movement. It looks pretty smooth. I mean, I guess if you're doing a whole bunch of movement, then, you know. But, excuse me, as you'll learn in the future, but it's a helpful function nonetheless. Writing a function that returns a value. You can make your, you can make your function return values. Really? I had no idea that I could take my functions and return values. I thought they were just your functions. Wow. Some of the wording of this is just like, and you can do it too. I'm like, that's why I'm here. I thought we were running the same, the same code here, the same engine. Like, they're going to say like, sorry, actually, it, we've been using Unreal this whole time. You can't do none of this. <laughs> um, Okay. To make a function return a value, you can use the return keyword followed by the value in question. In previous lessons, we had characters walking on grids. And for those practices, we were working directly with cell coordinates. Well, cell coordinates don't correspond to the positions on screen. To find the center of any cell on the screen, we need to convert 
Sales coordinates position on the screen in pixels. Yes, I did do this one. I thought for sure I hadn't gotten this far. I did. It means that not only built-in functions can return. Uh, I get it now. Okay. I mean, I would assume so. I, I would figure that if it works with functions, it would work for most all functions. Like, whether it's a built-in one or you define your own. I guess there's probably some that don't work either way, but if it's something built into the game designed to do something to a function, I would probably assume that it works for all of them. At least I would be willing to try it. But um, in previous lessons, blah, 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 blah. Okay, yeah, this, this I think, is what eventually broke the camel's back, I think. I think trying to figure out All this might have been what killed me. Okay, to do so, we use a function. Really? You use a function to do function things? I'm talking shit now, but I am absolutely going to lose my shit in about T minus 45 to 45 seconds to two and a half minutes. First, it multiplies the cell coordinates by the cell size. Where do you get the cell coordinates? I'm assuming the top left corner of the cell? Or just like coordinates just like graph paper coordinates not pixel coordinates yeah that'll be it this is like okay it's never mind i'm dumb okay never mind don't don't answer that okay it gives us a position of cells top left corner on screen in pick yeah okay so the pixels is the top left corner position got it then we add half of the cell size to get the center of the cell Why do you need the center of the cell? So coordinates don't come on to position on the screen. To find the center of any cell on the screen, you can put a cell coordinates to a position on the screen in pixels. Oh, it's just wanting to find the center just for, for funsies, I guess. Cell size. So it's a cell with size 120 by 120. Center is useful to have. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Like, I guess if you're wanting to place images in the center of boxes than having the, the center of both your image and the box is a good idea. Um, cell size is 120 by 120. Function convert to world coordinates. That's a long, long function name. It's very descriptive though, so it's just a lot to type if you want to use it over and over and over and over again. Convert to world coordinates cell. Return cell times cell size plus cell size over two. So, correct me here. Now, cell size plus cell size would definitely do it. But... I guess the this is interesting because I feel like the the order of operations. So you would get cell times cell size first, and then you would get cell size over two first, and then you would add the two together. Cell times cell size. Is for getting the top left of the correct cell. Okay. So if cell is 1 times 120 by 120, then it, the that'd be 1. Okay. And then, okay, so it is using order of operations. I'm just looking at, I'm just looking at it as if not. So find the top left corner of the cell. Yeah, exactly. So... Basically, this is take these coordinates plus half of the cell size. That make okay. Then you're you basically get 180, 180. That okay. It's 
Yeah. Exactly. That makes way more sense compared to last time I did this, like a couple days ago. And this is, I think, what made me quit because my three in the morning, not very well rested brain did not even consider order of operations to be a thing that existed at all. <laughs> and remembering that very much <laughs> makes much more sense that you do this and then this and then this. God. Of course, to make it easier for me, and I don't know if, I don't know if the engine would appreciate this or if it would freak out. But if I was writing this out for myself, I would want to put parenthesis, uh, parenthesis here and here and here and here just to make it easier for me to see. Okay, cell time, cell size, cell divided by two or cell size divided by two and add. You can do that. Engine won't screw. Okay, that's good. Um, I'll probably do that in the practice actually because it makes it easier for me to read. Just reminding myself later when I go back that it is, in fact, this thing plus this thing. Do And they're each their own. I know they're not necessary because of order of operations, but I'll probably still do it just for my own ease of reading. Um, the return keyword returns a value to the code calling the function. Receive the result when uh, were you call the function. Okay. Variable cell size equals that. Run. World position equals convert to world coordinates. One, one. Okay. Interesting. So in this example, it's assuming that this function is something that they've already defined somewhere else. This is not a built-in function, because right? Because they've done this already. So it's basically assuming that this is like later down. Yeah, exactly. This is later down the code, so to speak. So they should have um, they should have continued the line numbers from up here. I guess it's like here, but okay. I don't know. Now, I would have maybe I would have done four, five, six, seven, and then done a comment here saying, "Oh, variable cell size defined above," and then done this. I don't know. I mean, is. But I still understood what it was. Okay, some functions return variable of uh, the values. Too many V words. Some functions return values and some do not. During practices, you can learn which functions return a value using the documentation panel. Uh, it will display if the practice requires using specific functions or variables. There, functions that start with the term void do not return a value. Any other term means the function does return a value. You'll learn more about what other terms mean in a couple of lessons will return value. This very last paragraph is like, wait, what? Okay. Okay. Some functions return value, some do not. During practices, you will learn which functions return a value using the documentation panel. It will display if the function the practice uses uh using certain man. I am on a long streak of not being able to read today. Maybe I need to start reading more books because I cannot read. There, as in, in the practice, functions that start with the term void do not return a value. Any other term means the function does return a value. Sure, I'll just do it and hope that I can figure it out. You find a function that converts a position on a grid to the screen. The function takes a vector2 coordinate as an argument. It should return the corresponding vector2 screen coordinates to the center of the cell. So we just did this, right? So it the actual it's cell plus cell size. No, it's not cell time cell size. And I am going to actually, don't you give me the other side of the court, the thing, you son of a bitch. Uh, and then it's cell uh, size over two. 
uh, and then I need to do return return like that. There we go. I knew there was something at the beginning, and probably you know the whole thing that that last the lesson was about. I'm like, wait, what goes at the beginning? I know I'm missing something. You know, the only thing that they were talking about in the whole lesson. You know, I, you know, nothing, nothing special. <laughs> Uh, probably the word return. I like how it made that whole thing about, oh yeah, the documentation panel, the word void, and I'll, I'll learn it later. How it was like, you'll learn about it later. I'm just, I'll just learn about it later instead of confusing myself now. Okay. Appending and popping values from arrays. I'm fairly certain that I have not touched this lesson yet. I'm pretty sure the last one broke me. Because I didn't understand, like I said, I had no clue what the hell I was trying to talk about because my dumbass 3 a.m. brain had no clue what the order of operations was. We've already gotten into a raise just barely um, with the four, the four loops. It briefly mentioned appending them, but it was like, you'll learn about it later. I'm like, that's good because I have no idea what you're talking about. In previous lessons, you learned how to create arrays to store lists of values and how to loop over them. It's nice, but you won't go far with only that. I mean, you probably could go pretty far. It's amazing what you can do with really simple code. Just really, really simple code can get you a long way. Like a long way. So, very useful thing. Of course, and of course, it's nice to keep learning. Okay, the real strength of arrays is that you can add and remove values from them at any time. I you to queue or stack data. That, that, you're true. You're, you're, you're true. What the hell? Okay. Um, that, that is super helpful. So you can, yeah, that makes, that, yeah. So, out of curiosity, now obviously, I guess you could. Use Godot engine, but why? But if you were, for example, using Godot to make a database system, and I guess you could do it in a, in a video game as well, but if you just wanted like a, a desktop database application, you could you would use an array to store your information itself, right? Because you can store strings and numbers and all that kind of value. So you would want to use arrays and you would want to append the array when you add their address other name or possibly both see and i don't know about dictionaries yet maybe it'll cover them later so but as far as so if you wanted to store um um where an npc uh needs to maybe resources okay i mean it's one of those things just like i always talk about with cad or just like we mentioned in rpg maker there's a couple different ways to do it. Pick your favorite, whichever one seems to work best for you. And hopefully you don't have to go back and change it all later. <laughs> okay. You're making a restaurant management game, I am. Where customers place orders, and you need to handle them as they come. In this game, customers order meals that end up in a queue. You need to prepare them in the kitchen. In this example, we simulate orders arriving and getting completed over time. Tomato soup, toast, burger... Cheese sandwich. Oh, that was fast. Man, I got... Man, I wish my food came that quick. Cheese sandwich. Not like a grilled cheese sandwich? Just You're just going to put cheese on bread? You're not going to grill it or toast it or... No? That's a little interesting. At least make it like melted cheese. I feel like... I feel like just a slice of cheese. Be a little unpleasant on its own. I could go for... Saz, come on over. We're doing a cookout later. It'll be like 4 a.m. for you. No, it'll be that late. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1. It'll be 1 a.m. for you. That's perfect time for a burger. Oh, boy, 3 a.m. All right, sweet. By the time you get here, we'll kind of be packing up. No, you you could... You'll be landing right about as we... Right about as we start. I'm breaking out the grill for this nice American... Summer that's starting now. I mean, the sun's up. It's gonna be nice out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be doing. We're gonna be doing some brats as well. Probably some corn on the cob. Be pretty good. Come on over, man. 
Uh, how do you keep track of pending and completed orders with an array? Uh, when a customer purchases a meal, you want to append it in the array. So the array would start empty. And then as you click on the customer or whatever, uh, an append, the append function will pop. And, uh, I say pop as in like it'll run. I need to not say that because popping is is different, as it's saying. Um, an append function will 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 run, and it will add. That way, the only thing in your array is tomato soup, and then more things come up. Got it. Okay, you can do that with the append and pop front functions of the array. So okay, interesting. So you want to control the order of the array by doing pop front. Is that what that would do? Uh, try to read the code below before moving on. Don't worry if not everything makes sense. We'll break it down. Good. Good. Okay, very uh, variable waiting orders, completed orders. And they're both empty, but we've established the array. Function add order meal name. Waiting orders dot append meal name. So meal name is another variable that we're waiting for somewhere. That's not shown here. Okay, function add order. Waiting orders dot append. So that's adding meal name to waiting orders. So meal name is going to come from somewhere else in the game somewhere. It's going to be a variable that's a string probably. And that's going to be, it's in the function call. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you, you would make this some kind of a string somewhere, wouldn't you? So you would want this to be, you would also define this somewhere else. Call the function you would write. Yeah, you'd write like add order pizza. Yeah, add order cheeseburger, exactly, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. All right, and then function complete current order. Uh, variable first underscore order. We don't have defined, but that's defining it here. First underscore order equals waiting orders pop front. The first order is waiting orders pop front. Completing orders to append first order. Like. Star Wars, the first order. Uh, okay, so I guess this doesn't make sense yet, but it will. They said they will show me more. So, okay. Okay. First order equals waiting orders pop front. Is it just grabbing the first one only? That's what it's saying. Just whatever the first one is, is, is what it wants. The first one is the first... First order equals whatever the first on the list is on the waiting orders array. Is that is that it? Completed orders add the add that. Okay, okay, nice. So interestingly, they've added another variable here. I guess it would be good to see like what's next in line, but why not just do completed orders dot append and then in here do waiting orders dot pop front can you not do that can you not nest them like that or or no you can okay easier to read okay and i guess it's not bad to have that extra variable in case you need to use the first one on the list for something else do you want that to be over on the screen or something or in the top corner or something like that the next one you need to do so that that does make sense okay I'm assuming when you append, it goes to the end of the string. It doesn't cut in front. So if you do add order cheeseburger, add order pizza, add order uh, hot dog in that order, then they would it would read in that order. Okay. Append goes at the end. Okay, cool. So they it's first in, first out, essentially. Using, the, using this, it is automatically first in, first out. So if I do... If I append one, then append three, then append two, it would read one, three, two. Got it. 
Okay. Notice how we call some functions by writing a dot after a variable name. That, yeah. A given value type, you know, sub variables, it's also have its own functions. Yep, we looked at that with the robot who has its own function within him, which actually, as an RPG maker person, that makes sense to me. I mean, I know all engines do it, but it makes a lot of sense. Because I can basically say, yeah, grab this from this character or this this map or this thing. Grab grab this function that I defined in, in that guy and use that. Okay. Functions like append and pop front only exist on arrays. That's why we uh, that's why to call them you need to access it from the array using the dot array dot append. Got it. Let's break down the code. Break it down now. Uh, we queue orders in the waiting orders array by appending them to the array. Waiting orders, add order meal name, waiting orders dot append meal name. Okay. We can use a string to represent a meal when calling the add order function. Ex yep. Okay. Cool. Add order cheese sandwich. Cool. Uh, when completing an order, we remove it from the waiting orders array by calling its pop front function. Function gives us the order back, which allows us to assign it to a temporary variable. Yep. Okay. Oops. That guy back. That was a needle. Okay. Um, but that sounded. I. I do not keep random needles next to my desk. This is flux. This is flux for soldering, and that's why I had a needle because it's a it's a syringe for for flux. That sounded like I do bad things at my desk. I promise I don't. Okay, you can append the order to our uh, we, to our blah 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 blah. Uh, variable completed orders that uh, is nothing. Function complete current order. Completed orders that append first order. Okay. We call arrays like waiting orders in a queue. Uh, we call arrays like waiting orders a queue. The first element we append to the array is always the first one we remove. What does that's a comment, right? Uh, we write that to represent ellipses in the code. We're completing the functions code. We break down code establishment. Just comment. Yeah. So basically, they're saying we we got whatever else that there's more or less there that they didn't show us. Um, I wish they'd use the pass. Uh, pass that they showed me earlier. I know they're basically saying, hey, like we'll do the rest here. Um. But. I get why they're doing it, but uh, I do like, I that's one thing I really, really, really need to do more of in all of my next practice projects and my, my next actual project, which is comments for my own sake and my own sanity. I need to comment the whole thing out. Um, okay. Using arrays as stacks. Another common use of arrays is stacks of data. Good comment, to, a good habit to have. Yeah, it, for my own sake. Even if I literally need to comment out how to do what I, what I was doing at the time, because it might have been a while. Another common use of arrays is stacks of data. The, take a factory management game, interesting, where you need to retrieve materials from stacks of crates. They arrive at the factory, pile them vertically, and you need to take from them from top to bottom pop back which is the last one in the list so if, okay so if that makes sense so pop front is the first in the list pop back is the last got it nice and easy or if you're old it means to have severe back pain you pop popped your back Okay, to create, uh, to take a crate from the back of the array, this time we use pop back. Uh, this function removes, removes or pops the last value from the array returns to, so it actually removes it. 
it actually removes it. It it doesn't stay in the array when you do when you use pop. So if I do if I use this, then it is no longer in that array that it was in. Pop functions remove it. Okay, that's good to know. Because I was assuming that it stayed, that it just grabbed the value like a copy, but it's a cut. It's not a copy, it's a cut. Got it. Uh, here we pop the last value of the array and print what's left of the array to demonstrate how the array gets small. Okay, so I guess if I would have kept reading. Okay. Because they don't print until the end. Okay. 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 This is a very long lesson. Like pop front, the function returns. What's the difference between return and print? Print is specifically for... Because to me, they both seem like they just return a value to output. It's Print just shows it to you in engine. So return is more like... Writes it in output. Okay, then what is return then? Because with the demonstration they've shown, return does the same thing. At least what it looks like. Is return more so like in-game? Return is in-game. Pop or print literally is the output in the engine. Return is like in, in the actual game. It would show it to the player. Is that... Maybe I'm wrong. That's, I don't know. Is the value itself, okay. So not necessarily something that you would see. It would, it would be, it might be a, a, a hidden value that, that you would take. Okay. 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 I think I... I think I understand. Okay. I think I get it. Okay. If you then write root name equals add to two... Okay. That, yeah. But that makes sense. That basically means you can almost, if you're always going to be doing the same math, and I know there's tons of other uses for it, but if you're always going to be doing the same math over and over and over and over again, you actually, you could use this for 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 moves, like uh, calculating damage for like RPG Maker. You could do uh, uppercut um, at, and then the level or whatever. And then multiple, multiply all the different values or, or whatever. I guess that there'd be easier ways still to do that. Um, but that, okay. Okay. And then the return would literally, you could, you would say do move uppercut and it would. Okay. That, yeah. Okay. And there, there's tons of different ways to do that. And I, yeah. Okay. Cool. Basically, you don't, you don't necessarily want to show the number itself, you're using the number that the whole function represents. Got it. The showing the actual number doesn't necessarily matter. It's the actual... Okay. Yeah, I've used a little bit of return, but they didn't specify what the difference was. If they did, I didn't understand. The waiting orders array will be filled over time. Your job is to remove orders from the waiting list to the completed orders, thus using the array's append and pop functions. Remember that the array's pop front function returns the pop value, which al allows you to store it in a variable and pass it to the... Okay. Um, is it going to start Give. Hang on. Complete current order. Oh, okay. So I need to... Um, 
Okay, so I need to variable uh, first equals uh, completed orders dot pop front um I'm back welcome back Sid and then no waiting orders oops first in the waiting orders and then I need to do completed orders dot append first I think let me reread this to make sure sure hey okay damn nice I'm just surprised I'm surprised myself don't be too impressed that was that was like 90% brain power there Let's stay in and double and re look again just so I can. Okay. Interesting that they put a space here. A space colon equals. Interesting. I never noticed how they. I didn't notice how they actually formatted this part up here. I haven't been looking at that. They didn't actually talk about it themselves in the text. So I do need to remember how they did this. Colon e equals, and then the brackets for the array itself. They probably did to show how it works, and I just didn't, don't remember it. But, okay. I'm sure they did. But, okay. So colon equals, and then the square brackets, and that's where the actual stuff would go. Okay. Continue. All right. Crates are piling up on the platform. Move them out of the way by popping them from the crates array. You need to remove them from the top by using the array's pop back function, which remove all the crates in the array using a while loop. Personally, write it like var waiting orders array equals zero. Or equal, not zero, I'm sorry, that's the square brackets. Array equals, okay. So you can actually write array. Interesting. Interesting. I'm sure I'll learn a lot more from you in different methods of writing it out in different. Um, I don't know how else to say it other than like a different accent, but um, different styles of the same thing, as as uh, as you end up showing me more as well, and that'll really help. I like to have it spelled out what type of variable it, that makes a lot of sense. So to spell it out right there or maybe comment it out um, is, is really helpful later. Okay. Yeah, documenting your own code is basically the biggest thing. Okay. Move them from the top. Your code should remove all the crates in the array using a while loop. If you run a while loop carelessly, you can lock the software. You can check if the crates array still contains values by writing while crates. Okay. So basically that just means while there's something in it, this while loop can proceed. Okay. Okay. So even though technically the array itself still exists, Basically, that just means if there's something there, it's a valid array. If there's something there, it's true. Otherwise, false. If there's something there, it's a 1. Otherwise, it's a 0. Okay. My brain completely just forgot how I need to be doing this. So, moving them out of the way. From the bottom, top to bottom, using the pop back. So, I... Um... Rates dot pop up back. Um, is that it? Actually, that's not it. Is it? No, it's not. 
What am I? Oh, duh. Maybe. Maybe I can, you know. You can probably also write while not star empty. What? While not underscore empty. Interesting. Okay. I'm not. Okay. Quick centered code. She. Because it was crates is underscore. Okay. Well, not is empty. Okay. That makes sense. Let's try it, actually. Um, while not, while not, I hope if I don't caps lock this thing. Okay, while not, and then you wanted me to do crates is empty? Like that? A dot, not a space. The crater ray is not empty. Oh, duh, it's, it's, hang on. Because it, I already did it. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Reset. Didn't like it. Okay, I, I probably screwed it up though. Don't know why it's screaming. I don't know. Crater is not empty. No clue. It doesn't like it. I don't know, man. I might misremember the keyword. Like you're so basically you're meaning you misremembering it changed between three and four. Okay. So you're it might be different from is empty, it might be something else. Okay. It's still good to know that there's other ways to to, to check that. Lesson complete. I think I've got four more. Maybe five more, including this one. All right. You learned to loop over all the values in an array using the four keyboard. Keyboard? What the fuck? Maybe there's alcohol in this. I didn't put any, but maybe it just materialized. Maybe I need to, like, take a sip of regular water. Maybe it's, uh, the thing, the circle thing. Okay. For value in a, an array, print value. And that will list the whole thing. Maybe it is using good 03. That'd be very interesting. I thought for sure it says good 04. Now I want to go back and see. What was it in 3? Or did it not exist? Or maybe they just um, limited the example itself. Quite honestly, that could have been what it was. They just limited the example. Just empty. Can I go back? Uh-oh. I can't middle click and scroll. Okay. While crates oh, crates dot empty oh as well not sorry well not crates dot empty um oops uh crates dot pop uh back 
Yeah, they are using Godot 3. Interesting. That's very interesting. That's interesting because I'm hoping to use Godot 4 for my game. So hopefully there's not a lot. I mean, a lot of what they show me, I'm assuming, is just kind of basics and wouldn't change all that much. But um, hopefully there's nothing completely... Not Yeah, that's usually what it is, especially like the super basic stuff. So, okay. Hopefully I don't run... I mean, if I run into issues and I just... Google if something to whatever effect changed in Godot 4 and it'll be like, yeah, of course. Signals are changed a lot too. Well, lucky for me, I don't know what the fuck signal is yet. So, you learn to loop over all the values in arrays and what if you need to access the uh, third or tenth or whatever. Dedicated notation to access one element in an array by index. To do so, you square brackets with a number inside the brackets. Array name index. That's a lot of square brackets, man. Array itself is defined by square brackets. The number in the array is defined by square brackets. Oh, you can, uh, interesting. You can do the array like this. I kind of like that better. Does this have to, does there have to be a, uh, indent here? I would imagine they're putting one. So I'm assuming if you do it this way, you have to indent each spot. But that's still not bad. I'd like I like this way better. At least doing this. I don't think I oh well okay. I'll, I'll I guess maybe I should try it. Just easier to read. That's true. I was just wondering because I know that Godot does care most of the time whether there's an indent or not. So I figured they had it, so it must need it. Because I figured if it didn't have it. And a new advice for you know what I mean, so I guess I'll try it honestly next time I use an array with um I'll, I'll try it. Doesn't hurt to try it. If I get an error that says the array is messed up, then all right. Index zero is the first element in the array because it starts with zero. That's gonna confuse me. I if I think about it, it makes sense, but I will have to basically convert. Pretty sure it'll work. I mean, it doesn't hurt to try. You know, like we were saying earlier, you will never figure it out if you try. Kink. Okay. Yeah. Fourth by inventory in the rear, like so. Inventory three. Yep, cool. Can you change the code on the right? Unfortunately, no. I was hoping you could. I was hoping, and I understand they don't want you to screw it up by mistake and then not be able to see what was originally there, but I wish there was like a, um, they would put like on the right, like a, like a, uh, like an edit mode toggle switch, right? So you could like turn it off before you mess with it and then like a reset button, you know? So if you, okay, I want to, I want to mess with this, flip the switch and then you can do whatever you want and then, then reset. You know, so you can go back and see what they originally did. So, Bo, oh, I'm sure we'll have something like this in the training. So, okay. Index one is the second. Fourth is three. How do you access the third item? <laughs> Accessing the last values with negative. What if you want to access the last or second before last item in the inventory? Okay. I see. Minus one is the last item in the array. So essentially... Okay, so you can go backwards from the front as well. So if you start at... So you start here. Minus one loops you back around here. That's easy enough to... Okay, that's easy enough. Okay. The very convenient need to quickly access elements from the end of the list. So I was thinking, oh, there's like an imaginary zero on the other side. No, it's not imaginary. It's not. It's this, the zero from the, so, the, the start. So it's okay. Access the third to last item. It, that one is the actual number. You can't access non-existent indices. Indices. It's in. 
I'm the English speaker and I have no clue what that is. I'm guessing indices in I don't fucking know. Hang on. Can I type? I am just completely out of it. I had a long day. Oh, it's just the it's the plural of index. Yes. How do you actually pr like pronounce it? How do you pronounce indices? In I'm guessing indices because indexes. It won't. Indices. Okay, there we go. That's all I needed. Thank you. That's what I figured it was. But I'm like, how the fuck are you supposed to say it? Okay, can't access non-existent indices. Uh, there's a catch with the syntax. If we try to access an index that does not exist, you get an error. Uh, just be careful. Uh, always to access existing elements in the array. So that's interesting, right? That it doesn't just like, if you only have three and you say, okay, go back four, it doesn't go, okay, one, two, three, four, and doesn't like stop there. That makes sense that it doesn't without, I guess without, you could, you could do an if statement, right? To say, okay, how many do you have? Um, but it's interesting because that almost makes it unreliable to use that previous, this whole thing they just talked about. Because you say, okay, always use the fourth item in the array. Unless you are absolutely sure that they will always be at least four, you're going to get an error. A couple ways you can check for valid index. Okay, so. Picking the size of the array. Okay, so arrays come with a member function named size. You can call it on the array anytime to know its current size. Still useful. I figured it would be, otherwise it wouldn't show me. Um, they haven't shown me how to, like... Can you call a function to break a loop? Or to just... Or I guess you would actually just put the function itself for grab this fourth value in the array within a while loop or a for loop that would check to see like or while array dot size is greater than four, then you can grab the fourth. Okay. Or greater than value. Grab value. Um, pop. Blah, 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 blah. You can, and then you put value here. I'm assuming you can put a variable in this spot here, using this this um this spot here to find the one in the array you want. I mean, basically, I'm figuring you can basically put a variable anywhere, except for like the name itself of a function. But you'd put you just put the variable here. Um, work it out so that you can do it there. Um, okay. It's really useful. I figured it, yeah. Uh, maximum index you can access is an arrays, is an, uh, blah, 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 in an array is array dot size minus one. It's the last item in the, in the array. And we do the minus one because array dot size is going to give us the actual. So array, if we do array dot size on this, it's going to give us six. But six still isn't going to work because the array starts from zero. So we have to do the minus one. Okay. Okay. That's kind of weird that to do it that way. I wish there was an uh, array dot max value um, or a way to do array dot pop back without actually pulling it from the array. 
or no, because I still wouldn't want to do that. I would just want to. Huh. It's, I'm sure there's probably a way. Or technically, I could set it up for the, myself and just do this at the start. Variable last last value size minus one to set it up for myself, and then I don't have to worry about it. You can check if Twitch does not like you today. If it doesn't like the term SI, I don't know why it doesn't like SI. I don't know that. Is it just, it just hate Spanish people saying yes? Is that what Twitch is that? Is that it? See, si. see, si. it thinks it's a link. No, I don't know. That's so weird. Hang on. No, how do um go? Stop. Hang hang on. It's word to oh. I see. Well, now now you can post links, probably. There you go. I know this is the exact same way it worked out last time for Unhinged. We're just like, you're always here, Saz. There you go. You armed me with the one. Armed me with the sword. <laughs> this is exactly how it happened in Unhinged. We're like, you're always here. You're a good guy. Here you go. I don't. We don't. I don't have enough viewers for it to matter. And usually. Automod does everything, so I'm like, well, you're always here, and you're a good guy, and you're a good friend, so there you go. Gives you special chat permissions, right? So, no, you can probably post links. If you can't, then I can't help you. Again, Automod usually takes care of it, except when it goes beyond what it's supposed to. I know I have no links enabled because bots and scammers and all that. I've never been a good guy. Eh, Revan, you're, you're a good guy. You're fine. You're fine. All you guys are fine. We'll just mod everybody. <laughs> Revan also has a sword. That is correct. Out of water again. Damn, 22 ounces really is not enough. That's a bug. Get off my water. Can't have it. Mine. I need to get me a bigger bottle. In the following practices, you will use an array, use array indices to realign train tracks and grab the correct item in an inventory. Interesting. You're getting more creative as it goes. Very interesting. I want to see how they so last variable last item index equals inventory size dot one, and that would just, this just always uses the last item then. Okay. In our game, the player has an inventory that works as an array under the hood. They want to equip a sword and a shield to buff their characters. Like before, we need you to find them in the array. You need to access elements in the inventory array by index to do so. Call the use item function with the item as an argument to use the item. For example, you can use the first item by calling use item inventory zero. So use uh, item inventory and I don't want zero. Uh, I want a sword and a shield. So. I don't want one. I want two and three. 
right? Because it's cool. Speaking of swords. Okay. Someone really, who the hell did the, who the hell laid these tracks? Excuse me. We have train tracks broken down into little chunks in our game. We use them to make modular tracks and draw circuits of all shapes and sizes. However, several chunks are misaligned. You need to find them in the tracks array, pass them to the align function. Okay. So we need to access the array by index. Okay. This time though, you need to access them with negative indices. Okay. So a line. And then I need tracks. And then minus one. And then minus two looks like it's fine. But minus three and minus four, probably not. I can actually probably do this. No. Damn. Thought I could. Oh well. You're usually only modded to be the bad guy. You use a for loop. Okay. So. Four, um, um, oh shit, that is not, hang on, nope. That is not, technically that is not right at all. Um, I totally screwed that up. It will do, I didn't do it. <laughs> I completely fucked that one up, huh? Um, I don't know how I would do a for loop with the minus. And my old spot maker on the moderator sword. Um, okay, okay. Um, how would I use a for loop to do for, to detect which ones are broken though? Or I just do four in a, so I would literally just, so four broken in, and then I would literally just do, should I, can I, should I just do Um, sure. Would I do like this, or would I just do? That? Without the tracks. That's kind of what I thought. Okay. And then a... Oh. A line, if my fingers are in the right... Jesus Christ, I need a nap. Now on a good track. Good job. I like that. Align, try to align a track that doesn't exist. Make sure your indices make sense. Uh-oh. Oh, Jesus. Please, please no. Okay. Tracks... Oh, align tracks broken. And okay, yes, because I'm specifically using those and because I'm aligning the align function works with the tracks array, but I'm specifically wanting these values. So that, okay. 
Oh my god. I can't believe it. That one took some help, but it worked, and it's probably not what they were expecting. They were probably just expecting what I was going to do originally, which is just a line, minus one, a line, minus three. So, or a line, it actually, I should have done a line tracks. I would have still gotten it wrong. It should have been a line tracks, minus one, minus three, minus four for each different one. If I would have just done a line like that, it wouldn't work. But, um, okay. Good training for for loop. Exactly, That's and that's what I need. Hey, look! Saz, look! Look Look what we're at now! Dictionaries! It's almost like you called it. It's almost like you knew that dictionaries are important and would probably be in a basic training. Because it's something that it's important. In the last lesson, we used an array to represent a player's inventory. With just an array of item names, though, we can't easily keep track of the amount of each item. Instead, we can bundle the item names and amounts into a single dictionary. It's almost exactly, Saz. It's crazy. Um, a dictionary is a data structure that allows you to map pairs of values in the pair we call the first value a key as we use it to access the second. Okay. In other words, a dictionary has a list of keys and each key points to a value. So, a mailbox. The key would be, if it's your own mailbox, it'd be like the keys are the different recipients, or maybe the different types, bills, and postcards, and other letters. And the actual values themselves are the different actual pieces of mail. No? Yes? Or is it just, like, sword, and then just sword, 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 sword? Like a cell. Key is a cell. Values would you put inside of it? Okay. Okay, it's, yeah, organizing. Okay. Uh, to define a dictionary, we use curly brackets. A colon separates each key, and its value comma separates each key and value pair. Okay. That makes way more sense. So... You would want to do, it's not for, it's less about the different pieces of mail and just more how many you have. So I would do key one or junk mail and then 52 billion. And junk mail is the actual item. Um, steel swords, and I've picked up 20 of them. Steel swords and then the value would be 20. And then this is the value that would end up changing to possibly be zero. It's less about, it's not organizing items in a category. It's it's a value. Really, it's just a bunch of variables. Really. it's The dictionary is just a bunch of variables. Okay. Dictionaries can hold any values. Dictionaries can map about any value to any other value. For example, we can use the name of an item as a key and the amount as the corresponding value. This makes dictionaries excellent for keeping track of a player's inventory. Cool. Variable inventory equals bracket healing heart three gems five sword one one sword. One sword. How do you expect to win? Only one sword. You have five fingers. That's one, two, three, four places to put a sword. You have to quadruple wield a sword in each hand. 
How do you expect to win? With only one sword. You might think, no, you would want to use daggers for that, but to that I say, get good. Why would you want a dagger when you could have a sword? A great sword between each finger. <laughs> You're not going to break your wrist at all. <laughs> I mean, technically, you don't want to use anything for that. I mean... Having two blades just makes both weaker. No. I just make your hand stronger. Be alright. Now, I know physics would dictate because of the increased weight that your hand is carrying when you try to slice that the same force you're applying to your arm would equal would would be less because of the the weight it's carrying but to that i say surface of contact that's true that's but to that i say fuck physics i want to do what i want to do uses twice as much energy that again <laughs> that may be true but which of them looks cooler <laughs> That's a lie. Which of them looks more ridiculous? I think if you walked into a room as the player and the boss just had a sword between every single finger, you would just laugh your ass off and be like, nope, I'm not even going to fight you. You're, you're not worth my time. All right. Uh, that's why Trident is a terrible weapon compared to a spirit. That's true. That is very true. That's very true. But when you've poked up against a wall with a trident, to poked up against a wall with a trident, um, and there's a spike on either side of your um of your neck. Kinda. It's very threatening. One spear going right next to you is a little threatening, but having a trident just like either side you could do that with a bident. Is that a play on our on our president, commander in chief? No comment. We're we're not going to get to politics here. Okay, here we match the name a string. Same amount a number, but the key could be a string, a number, or even a vector. Ooh, binding is an actual thing. Oh, I figured it was. Um, I guess technically a um, like a roasting fork for like a hot dog would be a bident technically. Um, here we match the name of string to amount a number, but the key could be a string, a number, even a vector, and gross. Those made sense, kind of, but I will probably just end up using dot .x and dot .y values more often than not. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll grow to like them more, but I was not amused. Although we can have all of these different keys, keep in mind that every key has to be unique. Yeah, exactly, but it's talking about vector 2. It kept it was using vector 2 blank comma blank rather than just doing it was doing size vector 2 blank comma blank rather than just doing size dot x is this size dot y is this. I I should have been more specific. Vector 2s but I don't like. Although we can have all of these different keys, keep in mind that every key has to be unique. Couldn't have a dictionary like the following. Yeah. Okay. Get the following error. Okay. There's also vector three. And vector three can kiss my ass. I figured. Yeah, no, I know. I figured. Yeah, I know. Vec yeah. No. Nope. I'm sorry, it's healing heart. For whatever reason, I read sword and shield as the... Maybe I need a nap. I So I did a lot of work yesterday. Yesterday, I pretended to be Brandon. And that is... I mean, I wasn't actually pretending to be Brandon, but I did at my parents' house what Brandon does every day for a living. Now, 
Brandon luckily works in a lot of modern houses and a lot of a lot of businesses where it's just a drop ceiling and you can push up the piece of tile on the ceiling and just run cables that way. And Brandon, there's a lot of, and he has a lot more people around him that, that know what they're doing. But Brandon will even tell you that working and running cable for networking in my parents' house was fucking awful because he did it first. And I sent him a picture from my parents' attic, which has about four feet of vertical space. Um, and I don't know how much you know about American houses, but there's insulation all throughout the ceiling. Problem is, it's not like insulation can hold me. So I basically had to walk, crawl, only on the cross beams. Paper walls. Well, less paper, more like particle board. It's drywall. Or I actually have plaster because my house is like 180 years old or some bullshit. Um, but drywall is kind of paper, more like it's particle board, basically. Um, but. And they've got insulation and actual wood on the outside. It's just the interior wall that's fucked. Anyway, the ceilings are basically actually paper. Like, they're awful. And they have insulation on the top. And if I were to accidentally put my... Right? Um, point is, you can punch through it without even breaking your arm. Yeah. It would still hurt like a motherfucker. Like, mine, you could not punch through. Mine being plaster and an old house like this. There's a lot more wood. Um, I would, I have punched my walls and it fucking sucks. But yes, if I were to put my, basically as I'm crawling throughout my parents' attic, if I put my knee through the wrong spot, I would have fallen through the ceiling. And the attic is just, oh, you no, know, I, yeah, I, that was one of the weirdest things about being in Europe for a month, a couple of years ago. Do not fall through ceilings. Luckily I didn't, but that attic had been basically becoming a greenhouse for all the heat the 80 degree weather. Um, so it was hot, sweaty, and gross up there because it's an attic. So it's just all of the wood shavings and all the fiberglass, which I'd been breathing in for the entire time and free falling, no, um, and all that. And just dust and, and fiberglass and, Oh, it was awful and confined and dark because there's no lights up there because it's not living space. And exposed wire and it was awful. Luckily, my dad is much smaller than me in stature. Um, unfortunately, it's because he's getting older, but whatever. Um, and I helped him up there as much as I could, but eventually I'm like, bro, you are way more limber than me. And he's like, yeah, I got you. And so, luck, thankfully for him, he did a lot a lot of it. Um, Jesus, it was awful. Brandon thought it was going to be worse. But luckily, because the hard part was done, drilling the holes, because of him doing the first first time ages ago, um, I didn't have to drill holes. So I just pulled my new wire with the old one. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. <laughs> okay. We access the value of keys by writing the dictionary name with the key in between square brackets. How did I guess? Cool. Okay. Uh, changing values. We can also change values directly, which is useful in our case for adding or removing items from the player's inventory. Okay. So out of curiosity, and this is either going to be correct because of how, like, batch code, for example, works, or... This is going to be wrong, and there's going to be another command that I might learn as I scroll down. If I do this, Sazanek, if I were to do this right here, but the key healing heart did not exist, would it give me an error 
or would it create a key healing heart and then also add one to it? That is the question. Because either that'll do it, or there's a whole other thing for creating a dictionary key. Also, I'm ODing on healing hearts. Lots of healing hearts. Hearts of healing. Lots of them. If you do equals, it definitely makes a key. Then you do plus equals, it might return an error. Okay. Interesting. That's very interesting because more often than not, you would want to do you would want to add when they picked it up, and you want to add one to it. That's interesting. I'll have to check. Maybe in the practice, I'll get a chance to. Use a dictionary for the player's inventory. We define the inventory variable for you. Okay, so items. Uh, healing heart. Uh, three. Uh, gems. Nine of them. And sword one. Oh. What? Wait, what? Okay. Okay, that makes sense. How did I do wrong here? Oh, it's a, I have to do a comment at the end. Okay. I forgot about that. Okay. That, okay. I forgot about that. That makes sense. Okay. Because I could also technically... Do that. That also works. Okay. That's why you need the commas. Because it's... Okay. We want to change the item counts in a player's inventory whenever the player picks up or uses an item. We've started the add item function for you. The inventory dictionary should use the item name parameter as the key to access its values, and we should increase the value by amount. Okay. I don't actually remember how it wanted to do this. I don't remember how I would need to do this at all. So, so, item name, uh, equal, is that what I wanted, would want to do? Item name equals, um, the, remember about inventory. Inventory is the dictionary, yeah. My brain literally is removed everything that we just talked about. Uh, the, in the inventory dictionary should use the item name parameter as the key to access. So if I do inventory and then my I literally just I wouldn't, yeah, I would not have come to this. For whatever reason, my so the actual inventory and the item name in the, okay. We were literally just doing this. So if I get rid of that inventory and then item name 
and then plus amount. I don't know why that completely bl blocked out for me. I don't know why I completely lost that. I guess I didn't reread it enough in the actual thing. Oh, okay, yeah. Looping over dictionaries. Okay. Deep breaths. I feel like this might be tricky. Like with arrays, you can loop over dictionaries. You can loop over both their keys and values. Let's see how it works with two examples. Displaying an inventory's content. To display the player's inventory, you need to know what it contains. You need the, the name and amount of each object. And from code, you can only achieve that by looping over the whole dictionary, pressing processing key value pairs one by one. Okay. Get the list of keys in the dictionary, you can call keys member function. Because, okay, so in okay, for item name in inventory.keys prints, that'll print all, it'll print healing heart, gems, sword. Okay. Got it. It's something we can do. We do so much that uh, you don't need to call the function. Of course not. Uh, instead of instead, you can directly type the variable name in a for loop after the in keyword. The language understands you implicitly want to loop over the dictionary's keys. Item name and in inventory print item name. Okay. I still kind of like doing it this way, though. That makes me feel... Even you learn something. See, that's almost why I like... That's why I like documenting myself learning. Because sometimes you learn things that... In a, either a later version or someone else figured out. And I learn it one way and you watch me learning. And you're like, oh shit, I didn't know I could do it that way. And that's something that's happened with CAD a bunch. So... That's really cool. That's why it's really cool to, to experience other people learning. And that's why I'm streaming my learning process. Okay. I would probably still do dot keys to remind myself that that's what it's using. Because I, I feel like I would, I would forget. And it just makes it more... It, it makes it um, less ambiguous for the next person that goes through. Especially when someone like you, who is definitely experienced and would know what you're reading through for the most part when you're reading code, to know, okay, it is in fact the keys that they are grabbing. So that, I'd probably do it that way anyway, just to remind myself. It's good to know. It's not like it saves a ton of space. It's, it's literally um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven characters. Not like you're saving like eight lines of code or something. Okay. You can get the values with a syntax dictionary key as you learned in the previous lesson. It's not going to slide us in terms of form. Exactly. Um, you can get values with a syntax dictionary key as you learned in the previous lesson. We can loop over the inventory keys, get the corresponding values, and display all that information on the user interface. For item and inventory, item count equals inventory item name, item, item name plus, okay, the string item count. And the, this plus, this is literally just add a colon to it. Okay. 
for item name and inventory. Is this another spot where I could do inventory? I would really just want to do it because this is referring to whole dictionary, not just the keys. So item count. Oh no, this is one. I could, I should. You can't do keys there. Yeah. So this is actually shorthanding this right here. They're doing this here. Okay. So, so variable item count equals inventory item name. Print item name, colon, and then the string of the item count. Interesting that they want it as a string. I guess you're printing in this, uh, might as well, but interesting that they're doing it as a string there. Instead of printing the key value pairs to the output console, we can code and call a dedicated function that displays names in the user interface. For item name and inventory, item count equals inventory item name, add item, item name, item count. So this is assuming that there's a previously defined add item function that sets up an inventory of some kind and it's expecting item name and item count got it it's it's okay got it i should and i'm sorry it's not it is expecting them but you're defining them here so Okay. Mapping grid units, grid, sorry, grid cells to units. Okay. This is probably going to screw me up. We can also use dictionary uh, to map units to their position on a game board. That's how you typically code a board game, a grid-based RPG, or tactical RPG. While we focused on string keys so far, GDScript dictionaries accept any value type as a key, allowing you to map anything to anything. Only limitation is that every key must be unique. So you wouldn't be able to do overlapping um, characters in this example. Because as you... As these guys move, if they overlap, it would break. You could. How? Because the key would then be the same as they overlap. Unless that's super difficult and... Oh. Yes. Never mind. You would just... Okay. Because, and, okay, my, I'm, um, yeah. Each grid square itself is a dictionary key, just listing everything that's on it. For everything on that key, into the, yeah, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm going backwards, I'm thinking that turtle, that's like this, wants, the other, this, I mean, these... These can obviously repeat. For whatever reason, I was going the other way. I'm Again, I need a nap, apparently. Using a for loop, you can use the key value pairs to place units on the board at the start of the game. Using a for loop, you can use the key value pairs, that's these, place units on the board at the start of the game. For cell in unit cells, unit equals unit cells cell. Add unit, unit, cell, that. This is going to confuse me. This whole bit here. Especially it's right at the end too. This is going to confuse me. For cell and unit cells. So unit cells is the dictionary itself. Cell is our temporary variable. So every repeat is grabbing unit cells. This is going to be the keys. So you, this is actually unit cells dot keys. 
So for each of these, for vector 2, vector 2, vector 2, jumping it in here, we're making a variable, another variable, so now we have two. We have variable cell and variable unit. Unit equals unit cells, and then, that, again, that's technically dot keys, cell, which is this part. So now we're doing unit, which equals robot or turtle or robot or whatever. And then the cell, excuse me, which is the location. Okay. That is four lines of code that is very, very specific, but it does make sense. I'm gonna see. The exa I'm gonna have to do dot keys, or I'm not gonna remember what. I barely saws. Barely, barely understanding it. It's the shorthand, and that's. I'm gonna have to add dot keys for myself, or I'm not gonna remember what the actual hell it's actually doing with this. So. I might even have to like. Better off with dictionaries than a lot of people. I mean, I might even have to be naming my dictionaries like dictionary underscore unit cells or whatever. Dictionary whatever. Just so I know what the actual fuck I'm using. Or like you said, you, I'm assuming here you might be able to do like you do and actually do array blank. No, You might actually not be able to in this case. I don't know. I do have, yeah, see, underscore dict. Exactly. That makes sense. Then you can say you have a gigantic dict. Um, anyway. Uh. Good for you, Saz. Good for you. We all like a well-endowed dick. Okay. We use a dictionary to represent the player's inventory in this game. The dictionary keys are the name of items, and they map to the number of items that the player owns. You need to leap, leap, what the fuck, loop over the dictionary and display the name and amount of every item in the inventory. Well, the display item function it takes two arguments, item name and the amount. Okay. So four. Um, so we're going to have to do a loop to display everything, right? So four item in inventory dot keys oh shit okay I need inventory um dot so what I do dot keys and then brack no because that's already going Let's set up the rest that I know. So we're going to need to print. No, we don't want to print. It says do the display item. Item. Uh, item name and amount. So we're going to want to do item name. Let's see. Uh, so, could I be doing that, actually? And then... Because the keys are item, the item name. 
So their amount equals inventory uh shit see again this is the part that for whatever reason my brain keeps like erasing um dot yeah it's is it item name here Do I want to dot keys here? That'll work though, right? And then I think that act no, hang on. Item name isn't declared in the current scope. Shit. Well, I already screwed it up. Remember about an indentation for the last line, and you don't want the keys there. There we go. So I don't want the keys there because it's not obviously this is this is the keys. Because this is the keys because it's shoving the actual keys there. This is the keys. I'm literally grabbing the amount of this key, this key, and this key. So I don't want the keys there. If I do this at the beginning of the code, okay. Print inventory.keys at the very, very beginning, like the very, very, very top. Or no, it wouldn't have anything. Well, this like, um, here. In run. Like, here. Before the loop. Print. Uh, inventory dot keys there. Cook has an error. Let me actually reset the whole thing. No, it doesn't like it. We'll let you print custom stuff. Interesting. Hmm. The, yeah, I guess this is set up in such a way that it doesn't like it. Hmm. You want to show me what dot keys does? Okay. Hmm. Unfortunately, it didn't work, but... Oh, well. I guess I could technically... Once I actually get started in engine, we can do that test again, and I can basically do this, and then do a do that in it, I guess. So we can um, we can try it. Excuse me, we can try it again. Exactly, exactly. I do have the engine downloaded, so I mean. I don't know how long it would take to get to a point where I can do this. Have a, a blank slate, so to speak, to, to put some code in. Not long. I mean, Saz, if you can walk me through it here, give me a second. We'll we we'll press continue here so that we're actually on the thing. Good 04. Hang on. No, I don't need the assets library. Okay. Here we are. It, it loads quick. I got to give it that. I'm guessing new, new project. We'll just we'll just call it this for now. Um. Okay, I I said it. Look, there we go. Uh, I want two D. There we go. Now we're back. Whoa, dude. Out of curiosity, does it use the same 
Whoa, it does not use the same controls as I'm used to for moving shit, moving around in 3D space. Interesting. On the left, click 2D scene, it will do. Got it. Create a new two-dimensional scene. Yes, yes. Be like Tom Nook. Yes, yes. Click on that node 2D. Got it. On the left. Yep. Rapid fire. Rapid fire. Uh, click, uh, click on the scroll above it. Scroll with the plus. Yep. Got it. Means add script. Yes, sir. Just create. Isn't that good? Good. Cool. Oh, my. I'm already in a boat. I'm already in over my head. Move all except the first line. Boink. And then can I paste? Oh, this won't work because it's not a thing, but. Just remove the for loop entirely. Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. And now blow it right. Uh, new. Oh. There. Do I need to indent it or do I want it? He doesn't like it. Wait, space. Never mind. I'm sorry. Like that. That's a new function. Oh, Jesus. There we go. Still doesn't like it, but we'll figure it out. It's almost like you know what the hell you're doing. You told me to do the you told me to do the colon, I just didn't do it. First line of code run. Like above, like run there. As in within the function. Oh, okay. Uh Got it. Okay, okay. Should I just save this real quick? Press F6. I have a habit of just doing Control S all the time. Oh my. Oh, it did. The very bottom, right here. Healing Art Gem Sword. Okay. It did it. Okay, so it literally gives me the whole, the entirety of... Oh, it puts it in brackets too? Interesting. It, it, it's literally... I don't know if this is the correct way. It's literally generating an array, which is the key. Yes! <laughs> oh my god, I feel smart. I gotta tab back through here. Yeah, okay. I feel smart. <laughs> that is super useful to know, though. You wrote your first call. Oh my god! I mean, I didn't. I copied and pasted everything from there. I did exactly... I, oh, the very first thing I did in the, the practice environment was Hello World. I did. I haven't done it here, though. But, I mean, technically I could. Here, hang on. I don't like showing my desktop, but let me exit out of that. And I probably could as long as I... Nope. Oh, my God. I both love and hate automatically generated quotes and all of that. Why does it... Oh. 
No? Why? Aw, oh, come on. What the hell, man? It needs to be in. Oh, of course, of course, of course. Um, fuck it. Function print. Uh, print. Oh, it doesn't like that. Hang on. Function print. Print. Uh, hello world. There we go. And it still doesn't like run, but. So we're just gonna F6 anyway. It doesn't like it. What did I what did I break here? Can't just call a function in the open. There's no run for, oh my god. I'm done. It's print oh oh so actually I want I actually just want this. I, I'll just do it here. Jesus Christ. I love and hate automatically generated. If I would have were to change this to print, then it's fine. Now, now, now it works. Okay. Hello. I did it. I, I understand now. Okay. So, um... No, it's not going to like that. Um, while... Um... Uh... Uh... Ready function run immediately upon loading the scene. Okay. Um... I, I, I'm gonna try to, I, I just wanted to try to break the game, but my brain is failing me here. Um, yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I was gonna do. It should. That's what I used to do as a kid. Yeah. <laughs> print less text, print less text. <laughs> I mean, it technically it did work because not working is exactly what I wanted. It's like, please stop. Please. Please stop. I choked it out. Okay, cool. That's that's all I wanted from from Godot Engine. Now I can uninstall. I I did it. I've achieved good old crash. Yeah, oh yeah. And that, my friends, is why I have a bad good good habit. Of just spamming Control S, my left hand just has to, even in like Google Drive, the auto saves Control S, Control S, because I use uh, Vegas Pro to edit my videos, and well, I also learned the hard way enough times on an RPG Maker, because MZ crashes a lot less than MV, but dear God, do they both crash a lot. <laughs> Is this, is this 40,954 down here? Is this, oh, you can't see because my face is in the way. Hang on. Is this, uh, 40,954 lines? No, that's, yeah, that's the lines of, yeah, output lines. Yeah. 15 errors and then 40,000. Yeah. How many times it tried to print? No, that's how many times it succeeded. It's the errors that I'm sure... Oopsie. That's what I wanted. It's the errors that represents many times it failed to print. Print it. It looks so, so sad. I'm it looks like I'm choking him out. Ah. Uh. Learning is beautiful, isn't it? Thank you, Saz. You're the best. Uh, nothing like choking out 
a very nice, easy to use, um, dev, uh, game dev software. Like a simple game following. Honestly, yeah, I think I'm about ready to, and I'll probably do it quite soon. I do want to finish up with, um, the tutorial thing, because I'm on 20, less than 25 out of 27. So I'm right at the end. I'll probably finish it out just for good measure. Get their kind of closing remarks and the extras, you know. Um, I'll probably do that one that you showed me. As well as, um, exactly, I'll finish that out. I'll do the one you showed me um, on Discord. But then I also guess there's like a part two to this one. To, to this whole thing. Th th this whole, th what the hell? Th this, how about if I use this hand? There's, a, there's an extra to all this. That's actually like the same robot character in a game that you can also like code in and everything. How it's supposed to, so you can basically like modify on the fly. I might look that up and see how that works. Yeah, so I'm I'm gonna probably look into that as well, because um, there, although there are issues with this that I had, and just because of my learning style and my sheer time it's been since I've had to learn something in this fashion. Um, I mean, that was a good tutorial, very interactive and uh, very well made, and it worked. So, um, okay, let's do this. Uh, frankly, if you do it on stream, you can even follow Godot 3 tutorials if I'm around, because I will just tell you of any changes. Exactly, and like you, like you mentioned, 95% is the same. So if I'm having some kind of issue and I look it up, even if it's from Godot 3, I can basically just implement it. And if it works, fantastic. I know it works. If it doesn't, or if it kind of fixes it, then I know that there might be a difference to Godot 4, and then I just change a little bit, and it'll probably work. So between you and some Google Foo, we will make it run. Anyway, let's maybe finish out, um, let's maybe finish out these last two lessons. And then, uh, and then I might be done for the day. So let's, let's pedal to the metal here. Let's do these last two. We have a dictionary named units. Sure do. Maps a cell position on the grid to put a unit there. Using a for loop. For. Um, units. No. Positions. In units dot keys, and then I want variable um, unit equals. Uh, I tried to do inventory again. Units. Uh, positions, um, I feel like I'm missing something at the end here. I don't need a colon here. The bottom of the screen. Oh, hey, look. So place unit. Cell. It wants cell, it wants a unit type. So I can use unit type and it wants cell. Okay, which will feed it vector twos. Um, and the unit type is, and I need to change it here. I keep the name as, okay. I guess as long as I name it correctly on my end, yeah. 
And then I need, um, place unit. Uh, and then I want cell unit type. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. It was, it was this line in particular that I felt like I was missing something for whatever reason. I knew I didn't need a, a colon. For whatever reason, I felt like I needed something on, on line nine. But it works, so cool. It was good. Sweet. We're on 26. There's only one more. Value types. In your code, values have a particular type. You've already learned about several. Whole numbers, decimal numbers, strings, 2D vectors, arrays, and dictionaries. And saw something about 3D vectors. God damn. All right. The computer uses the type of value to know which operations and functions you can use with them. As a result, it's essential to understand types. They are not fully compatible with one another, and misusing them will cause errors. A, pro a prime example, you want to display the player's health in the interface. Your code tracks health as a whole number. A value type integer. Yeah. To display it on the character's on the player's screen, the computer wants text. It reads a value of type string. You uh you can yep. Uh, concatenate. I'm sorry, it took me way too long. Um, running the code, we will get this strange error. What? Display else. Oh, is this because it's not a string. This is. Um, yeah, is looking for this to be a variable, I would think, which is not the interesting that it, I get this invalid operand string and integer with op. You would want it, it would, I would assume that it's looking for a variable called health that doesn't exist. I would think you would get that kind of an error rather than an error having to do with, with that. But, okay, maybe you'll get both. Because you can't add values of string and integer, they're incompatible. Okay, because, never mind, it is defined, because health, we were, already, we're assuming that this is this health, and you can't combine the string and the integer. Okay. Convert health num uh, number into a string. <laughs> Converting values into strings. You can get the text representation of a value by calling the string function. Uh, the function returns its argument uh, as a new string. Function whenever you want to turn some number or vector into text. Okay. Cool. Exactly, yep, this is, okay. Okay. Converting strings into numbers. You can also convert strings into whole numbers or decimals using um, integer and float functions. These functions can convert whatever the decimal writes. I'm sorry, decimal? What the fuck? Damn, am I really off today. These functions can convert whatever the player writes in a text field into a number. For example, the player, uh, the number of potions to sell at once in a shop. Player input 10. Variable as whole, num as whole number. Integer player input. Okay. Some types are partially compatible. Most types are incompatible. For example, you can't directly add or multiply an array with a number. Yeah, because it doesn't know which value you want to deduce. So you would want to actually... Some types are partially compatible. It's like, yeah, you can. Yeah, it would give you. Okay. Yeah, that would multiply these and you still get the vector. But yeah, the whole array, because it doesn't know what value. Uh, 
Vector is compatible. Come on, I had vectors and you had vectors in school. I did. I did have vectors in school. We didn't usually call them vectors, but we did. <coughs> Or can, you cannot directly add or subtract a number into a vector. Get an error. That's why in earlier lessons, access the sub variables of position, add numbers to them. Equation. Well, actually, I'm not sure what I would expect to get because. Yeah, this is wanting in. This is integers, not floating points. So you'll get a whole. I'm inter interesting to see it crit one instead of two. I don't expect it to round up. And I guess you could tell it to round. Okay, so if you want floating, you literally add the decimals. Cut off anything after the decimal. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So if you want floating point, you add the decimal. Out of curiosity, could you just type three point over two point and leave off the zero? Would it understand? Probably, I would think. Apparently, adding the decimal... Is it the decimal place or the decimal? That would be interesting. If it's adding the decimal place or the decimal. I'm going to be able to try that in practice, I'm sure. Oh, so get unexpected results. It can get pretty serious. Number errors can lead to bugs like controls not working as intended or charging the wrong price to players. Understanding and mastering types is a key skill for developers. Programming beginners often struggle due to lack of understanding of types. Languages like GD script hide the types from you by default. As a result, if you don't understand that some are incompatible, it's stuck with when facing uh, type-related errors. You want to keep that in mind on your learning journey. When writing code, you need to understand everything that's happening. That said, let's practice some type conversions. Okay. I definitely want to try that. We're going to try it when we get an opportunity. That's why I type out all types. Yeah? Are you being serious? Like you comment out, or are you just making a joke like you type out the type? Okay. We want to display the player's energy in the user interface. Currently, our code has a type error. We're trying to display a whole number, while well, display energy function expects a string. Yep. Hang on. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. And I'm surprised it hasn't shown me that I can do that. Hmm. Anyway. I think I already solved it. Yeah. That makes sense. I like that. You might, I might have to. I might have to um, learn more about doing it that way. Go to write, for example, energy equals ha ha. It'll tell you, it'll give an error saying, hey, that's the wrong, wrong type. That is. So here, if I wanted to change this, if I wanted to change this, would I do str or string? But I would leave it at str, right? An item count, we want this as an integer. Here, string, I have to actually type it. Okay. If you don't specify the type, you can just do with a capital S. Oh. You sure go to good o2 or good o3 remember 
Is that a difference, maybe? It's also interesting that it would do... Oh, with it... Hmm. wonder if there's a difference. Or if for whatever reason, it's just not highlighting it for me because it doesn't understand what the fuck. It's probably just not highlighting it right. I bet you if I put this in the in the engine, it would probably do it for me. It's just not expecting me to do it this way. Okay. In our game shops. For now, keep it that way. If it gives you an error, this demo... Uh, this, it's just this de demo doesn't do it proper. I mean... In our game shops, we want to let the player type numbers to select the number of items they want to buy or sell. We need to know the com the number of items as an integer, but the computer reads the player's input as a string. Excuse me. Your task is to convert player's input into numbers for the shop's code to work. Using the integer function, convert the player's input, whole number, so the result in the item count variable. Okay, player input equals that. Okay, so int um, is that store the oh, hang on, Jesus Christ. Uh, variable equals your item count equals Jesus. I am not. I have two spaces there as well. I'm missing something. The variable is already declared before. So I can just do item count there. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, it doesn't like that. Interesting. Yeah, let's try. Because it didn't get, you're right, it didn't give me an error for the item count, only player input. It's literally STR. Was it really STR and. Oh. Oh, it doesn't like this either. Huh. Interesting. Maybe Godot 3 just didn't let you do that at all. Check with only int. It works, so there has to be an equivalent for string. There has to be an equivalent for string. I guess so. That or that or for whatever reason they changed that and neither of us know it. But I wouldn't think that it would change. That seems so weird. That's that's true. That's true. It's I wouldn't think they would change something like that. That seems so weird to change. Yeah, yeah. No, I I they said earlier that this is literally written in Godot, so. Okay, specifying types with type hints. By default, two layers at least. I'm at least two layers deep. But they're also writing extra code on top of running my code, so like, It's about type hints. Oh. 
They just do it now. Oh. Oh. Well, maybe we'll learn if it'll work or not. Maybe it is right. Okay. Unlike in some languages, in GD script, the following code is valid. Yeah, okay, because it unless we tell it, it doesn't it it doesn't care. Unless we have to unless we do what you do, it doesn't care. It's just a it's just a blank line that you can fill with whatever. Okay. Cell size, decimal number, or 2D vector. Games use grids all the time, be it for grid-based gameplay or to make algorithms faster. When working with grids, you need to convert grid coordinates. Uh, into positions in the game. Uh... Okay, using a vector two would uh, could simplify some calculations. For example, when converting grid coordinates to game world coordinates. In this example. Well, uh, because both cell and cell size are vector two values, we can add them. However, if cell size is float, you'll get a type error. Okay. Be in a minute, sauce. Cell size equals 50. Grid to world, cell, and then we did do this and this and then this. Okay. Cell is due to dynamic typing. We won't get an error right away. We we'll only get the error when calling. That that's a big problem because we're learning. We have small code examples in this course, but your game's code will get long and split into many files. When coding, forget about the code you wrote several weeks ago. A lot of code it could take hours to play before uh, players trigger a type error in your code. Interesting. Fortunately, GD script has optional type hints. Oh, Jesus. Go away, YouTube. Okay. Uh... I pencil let the computer know the value type you want for variables and report errors before running the code. Specifically, to, uh, the type a variable can accept. You can write a colon and a type after the name when defining a new variable. You could tell the computer you want cell size only accept vector two values, like so. If you try to replace cell size with another type later, the computer will not let you. Yes, let the computer figure it out. This script comes with a feature called type interf uh, inference. In many cases, but not all, the computer can figure out the type of variable for you. To do so, if you write without the type, the computer will set the type using the value after the equal sign. Okay, so by doing this, By doing this, hello, welcome back. So by doing this, it's um, nothing, Saz. How are you? Um, it's showing me that I can. I don't. I can also do it by just doing colon equals, and it will automatically set it to the type you give it as well, the same as um, telling it vector two or float or string or whatever. Which this might even be easier. Why bother to add hints? Why bother at all? Um, when you give the language hints, uh, when you give the language hints like that, it will prevent major type issues. Uh, when you work in Godot, you see the computer can report issues to write the code. Oh yeah, no, I, I understand that completely and I would, I would want to do that. In fact, I'm kind of upset that they didn't do that earlier when they first talked about variables. Like... I understand that only just now do we have everything 
like having an attack down frequently. That makes sense. Um... Yeah. Incredible third benefit for reusing type hints. You will learn types much faster. It's excellent for learning. Interesting that in this whole page, they didn't actually tell me how to define the type. They didn't tell me it's str for string or string for string or, or whatever. They basically showed me vector two. They showed me this. And I know just from before that int is integer. They didn't tell me about string. So, oh, you were right. No, you were right. It does work. It does. It just didn't work last time. Maybe the however they had it, had it set up, it didn't like it. I don't know. Okay, our variables get the correct values but not the right hints. Using your type foo. Okay. No, this is a, a vector two. And this is a string with a capital S. Even though the only way I'm knowing these is from it there itself. Interesting that I don't get a highlight for vector2 or string, but I do for int and float. Very interesting. That's what I figured. Okay. Fix the values to match the type hints. So I'm going the other way around. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Integer. 69. String. 669. Uh, vector uh, six comma nine uh, float six point nine. Uh oh, what I do here? Oh, oops. And then float actually wants to be that. No, oops. I I did not. Do that. I knew what I was doing. I just didn't do it right. I was more focused on 69. I knew what I was doing. I just was more focused on 69. Lesson complete. Oh my god, I made it. Yay. Hey, we did it. I don't know if I'll order courses. That was pretty useful, but I'll probably do tutorial videos, honestly, especially since there's so many like free assets available and stuff. Ooh, but they have like 3D stuff here. Interesting. Good to know. Well, interesting. They have a lot of stuff. Indeed they do. Well, that was actually pretty good. Some free, some not. I mean, yeah. That's cool. That's really cool. I like this. And I don't know what I'm going to be doing. I'll probably give it a couple days to, and, you know, not stress myself out. But, um, I will probably next be doing a, that video tutorial, probably in engine, probably follow it, or follow it along on stream, I would think, next time I feel like doing game dev on stream. But anyway, guys, I got shit to do today. I got a a, a, a grill, a cookout that I'm going to be doing in a little bit. Um, but I really appreciate you, Saz. Thank you so much for for being here. You're thanking me. No, thank you for all of your help. Seriously, man. I know I'm sounding sarcastic. I don't mean it to be. Thank you so much for all of your help. Seriously. I will. Uh, I will save a burger for you. I will mail it to you. Um... <laughs> I don't know if it'll get through customs, and if it does, I wouldn't eat it by the time it gets to you. But either way, have a super amazing day, everybody. Great stream. See you later. See you later, Sid. I'll see you later. All right, everybody. It's been fantastic.
Thank you so much for spending your day with me. Remember, on my channel every day is a weekend. Don't forget to hit follow uh, and join my Discord. Check out weekdayweekend.net for more weekend vibes. Until next time, have a fantastic week, and I'll see you next time next weekend. Bye, everybody. Bye, Saz. Bye, Sydney. Bye, everybody else. Bye, Revan. Revan, if you're still here, bye. Bye.